a necromancer who just wants to plant trees. Matthew found himself transported to a game world. He realized that there seemed to be something wrong with his system. Class, Necromancer. Quest, Planting Trees. Goal, 1000 Trees. Reward, Summoning Skeleton Dragon and a Large Amount of EXP. Chapter 1, Outstanding Citizen Matthew and the Bloody Necromancer. Gold Digger Basin. Rolling Stone Town. Spring. A robin with blue feathered back and yellow feathered chest flapped its wings and flew up from the lawn in front of the city hall. Over a few chimneys and red brick roofs. It landed deftly on an oak tree surrounded by many red and yellow walls. There were insects crawling on the branches directly below. The robin was about to pounce. But suddenly. A roar came from the translucent glass window behind it. Bugs quickly shook off the branches. The birds also flew away in a panic. All that remained were the five well-dressed humans behind the glass window on the second floor who were still arguing. I disagree. The plump middle-aged woman, Liz, slapped away the wooden board in front of her that had the words Outstanding Citizen Selection engraved on it. Then, she turned to the bald man on the left. Howard is a complete hooligan and scum. Not only does he like to hook up with married women. He even likes to seduce married men. He always took advantage of the time when women went shopping to look for their men. I've seen it with my own eyes dozens of times. Dozens of times. The more Liz spoke the more excited she became. Her saliva sprayed onto half the table. The four men couldn't help but shrink back. Calm down, Liz. The bald man comforted her, this is just a nomination. Liz's attitude was unusually firm. He can't even get nominated. Howard is terrible. As she spoke, her slender eyes looked around and suddenly seemed to have discovered something. Could it be that one of you has been hooked up with him? The four men trembled and denied in unison, no. The bald man tore the recommendation letter in his hand into pieces. The committee unanimously rejected Howard Rose's nomination. Anyone who had worked in City Hall for more than a week knew how scary Liz's mouth was. She was the walking gossip board. If one were unlucky enough to make it into her gossip knowledge, then the whole town would know about this rumor tomorrow morning. Everyone present was a respectable person. They could not afford to be slandered. Then, the last candidate to be nominated is Mr. Matthew from the Mage District. He had just lived in Rolling Stone Town for two and a half years, and he met the criteria for an outstanding citizen. His day job was as a history teacher at Seaver Public School, and the students all liked him. He also had a part-time job at the Public Security Bureau, and Captain Blake had a high opinion of him. According to the person who recommended him, Mr. Matthew is kind, warm, and generous. He doesn't have many friends in Rolling Stone Town and is always alone. The reason for this is that he's too busy to make friends. The bald man didn't finish his sentence. A gentleman on Liz's left raised an objection. Mr. Chairman, a recluse does not meet the criteria for an outstanding citizen. The bald man nodded slightly. Don't worry, Richard. According to the reference, Mr. Matthew had planted nearly 1,000 oak trees in Rolling Stone Town in two and a half years, which had greatly greened the town's environment. The oak tree outside the window and the three trees in front of the city hall were all thanks to Mr. Matthew. In addition, Captain Blake of the Public Security Bureau had given a statement. The person of reference felt that Mr. Matthew had made an indelible contribution to the public security and environment of Rolling Stone Town and deserved to receive this year's Outstanding Citizen Award. Everyone listened. They couldn't help but glance outside the glass window. Was this tree planted two years ago? Why do I feel that it has always been there? Richard, who was dressed like a gentleman, muttered. It seems to be. I have an impression of it. Matthew was a tall, thin, handsome, and shy young man. Liz looked nostalgic. This is indeed an outstanding contribution. Another man reminded them, but the most important criteria for the selection is whether they can get along with other citizens. The bald man nodded. It's usually so, but the owner of this recommendation letter doesn't seem to write anonymous letters often. She accidentally added her own name at the end. Richard clapped his hands hard. The recommendation violated the rules. We will directly reject this. All right, Rolling Stone Town still didn't have any outstanding citizens who could be nominated this year, just like the past three years. The rest of the people either shrugged or spread their hands, tacitly agreeing to this outcome. But at this moment, the bald man said, it was signed by Sif Suki. Suki. It was the surname of the Lord of Rolling Stone Town. 
Sifsuki was the only daughter of the Lord of Rolling Stone Town. The room was silent for two to three seconds. Even the most picky Liz raised her hands. Let's skip the nomination round. I support Matthew to become an outstanding citizen. The others all agreed. However, before the bald man could finish his sentence, he slowly pulled out an old paper from the bottom of the pile of documents. There's one last question. This is the registration form that Matthew handed to the municipal government two years ago. It clearly states his origin and profession as an adventurer. I wonder if he wrote it wrong. According to my observations, what he had done in Rolling Stone Town over the years had nothing to do with his profession and even contradicted it. However, if what was registered on this piece of paper was true, I'm afraid he'll miss out on our generous reward for being an outstanding citizen. What profession? Isn't he just an ordinary mage? Everyone curiously went over to take a look. The first thing they saw was a sketch of a smiling face. Chapter 2, Outstanding Citizen Citizen and Bloody Necromancer In the class column below. The word necromancer was written on it. Wow! Someone exclaimed. If it's a necromancer, then it really won't work. I remember that the Lord hates necromancers the most. Richard said seriously, but this might be a misunderstanding. How about this? I'll talk to Matthew after work. The bald man nodded. Then I'll leave it to you. Also, do the assessment work. To be honest, I don't believe it either. In the evening. North of Rolling Stone Town. In the newly formed Oak Forest. A tall and thin figure was busy. Matthew held a shovel in his hand and filled the newly dug pit with a thin layer of mature soil. There were a few small sacks on the ground beside him. One of the sacks contained a sapling, and the rest were empty. In the next moment, he planted the sapling into the pit. He covered it with several layers of soil of different textures. After the transplant, Matthew took out a bottle of green liquid and poured it on the soil near the seedling. Light green light waves surged. It was obvious that the seedlings had grown a lot. Its posture also became more resilient. You have successfully planted an oak tree. Your nature affinity has slightly increased. The accumulated number of oak trees planted and survived, 996. I'm still short of four trees. I'll definitely have enough by tomorrow. He looked at the sky. Matthew decided to rest and go home. Just like usual. He checked the contents of the mission panel again. Main mission, plant trees. Description, in the vicinity of Rolling Stone Town, choose a type of tree to plant on a large scale. Please proceed with this mission under the premise of ensuring the survival rate. No time limit. Beginner target, 1000 trees. Basic reward, undead summoning, bone dragon, and large amount of XP. Putting aside the rewards, if this quest were given to a druid, it would be normal. But the problem was. Matthew was very sure that he was a necromancer who had a strong foundation. After all. It was written clearly on the character panel. Name, Matthew. Class, Level 5 Necromancer. Attributes, Strength 10 slash Agility 14 slash Constitution 11 slash Intelligence 15 slash Intuition 15 slash Charm 16. Characteristic. Necromancer slash Fear Harvest. Abilities, Spellcasting slash Scroll slash General Knowledge, Necromancy and Magic, slash Insight slash Medicine slash Nature's Gift slash Summon Undead Creatures, Contract, One Third, slash Rotten Sack Understanding. Spell. I shouldn't have opted for dual skills at the beginning. He looked at the nondescript yet frivolous game system. Matthew's emotions were complicated. He remembered it very clearly. On the eve of his transmigration, he had been slaying the mud monsters in the Forest of Decay on his computer. He was rocking two classes back then. The two classes were Druid and Necromancer. In the end, he transmigrated in the next second. He became a Necromancer. Immediately after, Matthew found something even more confusing. After transmigrating, he had a game system. However, there seemed to be a problem with the system. In the game he played, the system names of different classes were different. The necromancer's system was called the Path of Undying. The druid's system was called Nature's Heart. However, in Matthew's transmigrated system, it was all a bunch of garbled characters and codes. Among the characters, he could barely make out the words Undying, Natural, and there were countless watermarks of the other stacked on top of each other. It made people dizzy. Matthew felt numb. Fortunately, the system quickly stabilized. At the same time, 
he was given his first main mission. That was to plant trees in Rolling Stone Town. Matthew, who had just arrived and had no family, had no reason to refuse. He started working diligently. This job lasted for almost three years. In the mage area. Outside an elegant and ancient two-story residential building. Matthew stopped at the door. He did not immediately open the gate. Instead, he looked at the alley opposite. Someone was waiting for him. Mr. Matthew. A young girl with a youthful aura ran out of the alley. The two guards behind her hesitated for a moment but did not move. The pretty girl jogged to Matthew. The sky was already dark. Matthew could still see the deep blush on her face. Bina. Matthew replied. Matthew, I'm going to Jade Court next week. Father wants me to go over and learn dance and art. I came to see you before I left. The girl lowered her eyes. Matthew nodded. Jade Court is a good place. Seeing that the girl didn't react, he added. The wood elves are good at singing and dancing. Their artistic taste is indeed above that of humans. The girl still lowered her head. Matthew could only say, remember to write to me when you go to Jade Court so that I can reply to you. The young girl's eyes finally had some liveliness. She raised her head slightly. Her big eyes were filled with anticipation. I will. Matthew, can you hug me before you leave? Matthew said awkwardly, I'm afraid that won't do. The young girl had already taken the initiative to hug him. Her soft body pressed against Matthew's chest. He could feel the rapid heartbeat. I like you, Matthew. Bina boldly confessed. Matthew let her hug him for a while. Then, he gently pushed her away. Then, he kindly reminded her, Bina, you're still young. You don't know what true love is. Even if you take 10,000 steps back, you've only seen the surface of me. You don't know the real me. Bina retorted excitedly, I know you. I've been secretly looking at you every day in class. I know everything you do. You are a good person. You love plants so much, and you love life. There's no man better than you in Rolling Stone Town. I have reservations about this point of view. Ah, I'm sorry to disturb you, but official business is more important. A man's voice suddenly came from the other side of the room. Bina blushed. She quickly hid behind Matthew. Then. Matthew saw a man dressed like a gentleman walking over quickly. Mr. Matthew, I'm Richard from the five-member committee of the City Hall. Regarding the outstanding citizen selection, I have an urgent message for you to confirm. This is the information you registered at the City Hall two years ago. Is this your profession? Is there a mistake? Matthew took the document from Richard and glanced at it. Then he said with unusual determination, there is no mistake. As you can see, I am indeed a necromancer. Richard was stunned. This doesn't make sense. You don't look like a necromancer. Bina also snorted. I don't believe it. You must be talking nonsense on purpose. Matthew's expression was normal. In the next moment, he suddenly snapped his fingers in the direction of his home. Not long after, the kitchen door was pushed open from the inside. A tall shadow walked out from inside and came to the garden outside. Richard and Bina widened their eyes. It was a two-meter-tall Toran skeleton. As they walked, the skeleton greeted them, Hey! Matthew, this is rare. Do we have any guests tonight? Matthew shook his head. I don't think so. He looked at Bina and Richard, who were dumbfounded. I'm sorry to startle you, but I must say. It seems that you don't understand me nor do you understand necromancers. Good night. Goodbye, both of you. At night. The thick aroma of mushroom soup filled the dining room and kitchen. Matthew and the Toran skeleton sat opposite each other and enjoyed their dinner. What a pity, Matthew. Skeleton said regretfully, you really shouldn't have let me show my face in public. This time, not only did you lose the selection of outstanding citizens, but you also might have lost the admiration of an innocent girl. No matter how you look at it, it's a loss. Matthew drank a mouthful of mushroom soup and looked satisfied. I don't care. The skeleton asked with interest. Then what do you care about? Let's do it in stages. At this stage, I just want to plant trees properly. Pa. Matthew gently put down the bowl. Peggy, go to the greenhouse and prepare the saplings I need tomorrow. I'm going to the basement to meditate. The skeleton cried out, why should I go? I've been working for 72 hours straight. 
I was the one who made the dinner of love just now. I'm so tired. Matthew calmly replied, You're a skeleton, Peggy. You won't get tired. In addition, I only have you as my contract summon. I don't trust the other skeletons to do these things. Peggy couldn't refuse. She could only curse as she walked into the greenhouse on the east side. Damn necromancers. Chapter 3, Undead Summoning Spell, Bone Dragon. The next day. Matthew woke up early. Today was Saturday. He didn't need to go to Seaver Public School during the day. It was just the right time to complete the final mission target. He carried a few bags of saplings from the greenhouse and hurried out. Peggy was indeed meticulous. In addition to the things needed for planting, she also placed lunch boxes and water bags on the shelf next to the sapling bag. This meant that she not only guessed that Matthew was going to do a big job today but also guessed that he would probably forget to get food from the kitchen. Such attentiveness was a miracle for a low-level undead creature. Sometimes, Matthew felt that it was not impossible for Peggy to plant trees for him. But he was only thinking about it. Although Rolling Stone Town was not a remote place where magic was extinct, and necromancers were far from being hated by everyone in the world of Ender, a walking skeleton would always attract many strange gazes. Not to mention that Peggy was a rare skeleton transformed from a dead tauren. Skeleton planting trees would definitely attract all kinds of criticism in a small place like Rolling Stone Town. It was troublesome just thinking about it. North of the Oak Forest. Matthew walked steadily as he surveyed the land ahead. He was choosing a location for the saplings. Planting trees was never an easy task. Seed selection. Germination. Foundation soil allocation. Fixed planting in greenhouse. Tree pit selection. Transplantation and maintenance. This series of steps had been memorized by Matthew in the past three years. However, there were all kinds of problems that needed to be solved in practice. For example, right now, Matthew had already prepared the saplings and tools, but he was unable to start work because of the difficulty of selecting a site. Rolling Stone Town is really not a good place to plant trees. He looked at the billowing black smoke coming from the west. Matthew sighed. The gold digger basin was famous for its various mines. The land here had been dug up several times by humans and cobalts, and most of the places were not suitable for plants to live. Man-made pollution was one thing. What was even more terrifying was the huge scar in the north. Matthew stood on top of a mound and looked north. It's getting closer. He looked at the black scar that was spreading from the north with a complicated expression. Scar of the Dead. It was a scar left on the earth by a natural disaster many years ago. It started from Jewel Bay in the east, passed through Jade Court and Eversong Forest, and extended to the Duke's territory and Gold Digger Basin of the Human Kingdoms. Near the Scar of the Dead, life force was extinguished. Even undead creatures found it difficult to survive. It was the purest and most brutal power of extermination. Mortals couldn't fight it. There are many similarities between this world and the game world but there are also many differences. There was no Scar of the Dead in the game world, and I have never heard of Rolling Stone Town and Jade Court. Could I be in the same game universe but not in the same plane? He retracted his gaze. Matthew walked down the hill. Behind him was the oak forest that was gradually taking shape. In front of him was a barren land, and behind the oak forest was Rolling Stone Town with red roofs and yellow bricks. The three regions were clearly separated. Sometimes, Matthew felt that the mission issued by the system might be related to the Scar of the Dead. Because the more he looked at the Oak Forest, the more it seemed like a shield in front of the Scar of the Dead. It was a pity. Just relying on an Oak Forest won't be enough to stop the Scar of the Dead from spreading. He thought casually. Matthew walked around the hill. He finally found a few suitable pits. Although this place was beyond his planned location, it was still a distance away from the Scar of the Dead. The oak saplings planted here might be able to survive. Limited by his physique and strength, Matthew could not be considered swift and decisive in his work, but he was more experienced. He maintained a certain rhythm and speed. Until the sun rises high in the sky. The saplings in the sacks had settled down at the foot of the hill. Matthew wiped his sweat, took out a bottle of green liquid from his pocket, and sprinkled it on the oak seedlings one by one. This was the green growth liquid that he had asked someone to buy from the druids of the Guardian Highland at a high price. It had the effect of accelerating and consolidating plants. If the plant were watered constantly, it would have 20 years of natural growth in a year. Unfortunately, this was the last bottle Matthew had. These three years. 
Matthew had invested almost all of his savings into the vigorous planting of trees. Now, it was finally time to reap the rewards. His hands trembled slightly. Puff. Drops of green liquid fell. The small sapling that had been wilting just a moment ago instantly flourished. At that moment, Matthew's eyes also lit up. Successfully planted five oak trees. Your nature affinity has slightly increased. Accumulated number of oak trees planted and survived, 1001. You have completed the primary objective of the main mission, plant trees. You have received the reward Undead Summoning, Bone Dragon, and Massive XP. You have leveled up to level 8. Unable to continue level up, remaining XP has been accumulated, please upgrade as soon as possible. Your Undead Summoning spell has been leveled up to level 8, and a contract slot has been added. Your Intelligence plus 1. Your Perception plus 1. You have obtained a new ability, Instant Summoning. You have obtained a new ability, Fixed Drop. Your ability, Rotten Sack Understanding, has been upgraded to Rotten Sack Mastery. You can now learn higher level spells. A dense stream of information flashed past Matthew's eyes. A huge sense of satisfaction surged into his heart. The increase in attributes and abilities did not exceed Matthew's expectations. However, in terms of experience, he still had some left after leveling up three times. This was much more than the amount of experience he gained from the necromancy meditation every day. However, what Matthew valued the most was still the Bone Dragon Summon. Undead Summoning, Bone Dragon You can summon a Bone Dragon to serve you at any time. Remark, this Bone Dragon is no higher than level 15. Contract Status, Contracted. It's actually in a contracted state. I even saved myself a contract slot. Matthew was very satisfied. Summoning was a necromancer's specialty, and it would increase with the level. Every two levels of profession's advancement would result in an additional contract slot. This was used to summon a specific creature. The necromancer needed less mana to summon the contracted subjects. The tacit understanding between the two sides was also higher. As time passed, some necromancers would even develop feelings for their contracted subjects. Cobalt Mine In a hidden underground cave Matthew held the withered wood staff and tried to summon the bone dragon for the first time. An incantation sounded. With the support of the new ability Instant Summoning, when the first syllable came out of Matthew's mouth, the dark cave flashed with a reverse hexagram array pointing to the negative energy plane. Grayish-white bone powder and dark green fire floated from the void like snowflakes. Matthew looked over. A giant skeleton beast that was mostly submerged in the darkness was lying there warily. A deep blue soul flame lit up inside the skull of the skeletal dragon. It stared coldly at Matthew. Matthew was a little nervous under its gaze. The air was constantly filled with the sound of the wind in the cave. The man and the dragon were in a stalemate. Matthew's muscles were abnormally tense. This was the first time he had faced a monster that was twice his level. The contract he had formed made him immune to the faint dragon's might. However, the immense pressure from its body and the fear brought by its terrifying image could not be ignored. It's no wonder that people are always prejudiced against necromancers. The subjects in the field of necromancy are scarier than the last. How many people can face this fear? Matthew adjusted his state of mind. He waved his withered wooden staff and ordered the skeletal dragon, bow your head. The skeletal dragon's movements were slow but firm. Its long neck slowly circled around the rocks and ceiling of the karst cave. Then, it landed steadily on the ground in front of Matthew. Its lower jaw was pressed against the ground. The blue soul fire was jumping. For some reason, Matthew actually felt a trace of nervousness from the spiritual fire of the behemoth in front of him. Matthew was amused. The skeletal dragon was nervous, but he wasn't. He mustered his courage and stepped on the skeletal dragon's head. The latter made a whimpering sound, appearing very docile. Matthew was relieved. He bent down and touched the bone dragon's bones. It was dry. It was also very rough. At a glance, it was obvious that it was not an expensive bone. When we have money, we will definitely get you a new set of bones. Matthew couldn't help but say. The bone dragon let out a low groan. The loyalty of Philoleus, bone dragon, to you has increased to 85. Matthew was amused. So easily satisfied? Then I should make more promises. The skeletal dragon slowly raised its head. It lifted Matthew up. Matthew was able to look down at the cave from a higher angle. This place was originally a paradise for gold diggers. Later, when the mines were exhausted and idle, 
it was occupied by a cobalt tribe. Dot. After the Suki family took over Rolling Stone Town, the local lord issued several orders to expel the cobalts. Under the hunting of the surrounding adventurers and mercenaries, the area gradually became silent and deserted. As far as Matthew knew, there were many similar karst caves in the Gold Digger Basin. These karst caves were complicated. Rumor had it that some of the karst caves were even connected to the vast underground world. That was also where the cobalts had truly retreated. Matthew rarely set foot in these areas. However, the size of the bone dragon was too big. Even the underground karst cave could not accommodate it. One could imagine how big a storm it would cause if it appeared on the surface. He was a low-key and pragmatic person. He had never intended to hide his identity as a necromancer. However, he did not want to cause trouble for no reason. In the future, I'll just stay in the cave with Philolius. He thought about it. Matthew carefully examined the skeletal dragon's body. He also checked his stats. Name, Philolius. Race, Bone Dragon, LV15. Attributes, Strength 24 slash Agility 10 slash Constitution 17 slash Intelligence 4 slash Will 10 slash Charm 14. Characteristics, Blind, 60 feet, slash Immune to Acid slash Immune to Cold slash Sensory Sensitivity slash Undead Creature. Ability, Flattery slash First Attack slash Undead Dragon's Might slash Dash slash Sweep Tail. Flattery. Matthew realized it later. Was he trying to flatter me just now? It was as if it was to confirm Matthew's thoughts. The bone dragon's bubbling sounds came from beneath his feet again. Coupled with the emotions transmitted by the leaping soul fire, this was definitely flattery. The image of a strong man that Matthew had just built up because he thought the bone dragon was in awe of him instantly disappeared. He could not help but stomp his feet. Your name is too difficult to pronounce. I'll call you fully. Philolius was at a loss for a moment. Immediately after, its soul fire began to tremble violently. Waves of joy surged through the contract. In appreciation of your name, the loyalty of Philolius, Bone Dragon, to you has increased to ninety. Perhaps it was too happy. Philly's head shook too much. Matthew was almost thrown off by it. Fortunately, his perception and agility were both extraordinary. He did a small, elegant jump. Matthew landed steadily in the shadows of the cave. But at that moment, he suddenly felt that something was wrong. He turned around and looked in the direction where he had landed. He stepped on a piece of clothing covered in blood. Chapter 4, A Gift from Nature You have used your ability, insight. Judging from its size and design, it originally belonged to a woman or a short man. The blood stains on the clothes had dried up a long time ago. Nearby, a string of messy footprints leads to a cave. The footprints are deep and big definitely not a cobalt or a knoll. A footprint left by a human, a bear gnome, or a half-orc. He noted down this information. Matthew meticulously put on his gloves and took away the bloody clothes. Then, he prepared to leave. The terrain of the underground cave was extremely complicated, and it was not something that a small necromancer like him could explore alone. Although the bone dragon was fierce. However, its size was not suitable for the cave. The passage in front of Matthew could barely accommodate two people. Fully definitely wouldn't be able to get through. Furthermore, it was obvious that this had happened a few days ago. Matthew thought that handing blood robes over to the security office was the best choice. The Suki family was one of the few nobles who placed great importance on the security of their territory. This was a well-known fact among the human kingdoms. If someone had really gone missing recently, the Public Security Bureau would not sit idly by. They left the cave. Matthew quickly returned to the city. Along the way, he realized that the main mission had changed. Main mission, plant trees. Progress, beginner goal achieved. Follow-up mission 1, keep up the good work. Description, please continue to expand the oak forest in Rolling Stone Town. Target 3000 trees. Reward, 10 XP per 1 surviving oak tree. Follow-up mission 2, maintenance is important too. Description, a new forest is easily destroyed by an accident. Please protect your forest well. Reward, different rewards for each successful protection event. 10 experience points for every oak tree. Matthew's eyes lit up. Wasn't this more exciting than fighting and killing? There was no risk in planting trees. As for protection, Matthew didn't care too much. Ever since the kobolds disappeared, 
the security of Rolling Stone Town had been very good. The bloody clothes in the Karst Cave should be an accident, probably related to those restless adventurers. My oak forest is planted on private land. No one would dare to secretly cut down trees, right? Matthew thought. Other than the two follow-up missions. Matthew didn't know when, but a symbol similar to Teji had appeared at the bottom of the mission bar. The symbol was divided into left and right, and the shape of both sides was exactly the same. They were both similar to transparent three-dimensional commas. The difference was the color of the light spots surging inside. The left side was gray, and there was only a trace of it at the bottom. On the right side was green, and a large number of light spots were rolling inside. They had already accumulated to about half. What was this? Matthew stared at it for a while. He found that the green light spots were slowly increasing. Especially when he passed by the oak forest, the speed of the light spots increasing seemed to be faster. The grey dot on the left was not moving at all. There was no note on the mission panel. However, he guessed that it might be related to the necromancer and druid classes. What happens when the light spots are full? Are there so many green spots because I planted so many trees? If I summon a few more undead or use negative energy spells, will I be able to increase the number of grey spots? Along the way. Matthew studied it with great interest. However, when he was about to reach the town, the appearance of an uninvited guest interrupted his thoughts. He <laughs> he. The laughter of a human girl sounded. Matthew's eyes lit up with a faint white light. He steadied himself. A thumb-sized elf with wings on her back flew out of the white light. She enthusiastically flew around Matthew three times, then shook the mini flower basket in her hand. A large handful of fresh fruits fell into Matthew's arms. Then, a white light flashed. The other party disappeared without a trace. Your ability gift of nature is in effect. You have obtained a large bunch of raspberries. Raspberry, a sweet, crispy and nutritious fruit with the blessing of fairies. After consumption, it can increase a little energy and has a slight purifying effect. My luck today is pretty good. When he saw the object in his arms, Matthew's slightly nervous expression temporarily relaxed. That was an oak tree fairy. They were the companions of the oak forest. The fairies appeared when the oak forest reached 500 trees. In order to express their gratitude and love for Matthew, they would send things over every few days. Most of the fruits gifted by the oak fairies were of extraordinary quality, but the problem was that these little fairies were mischievous by nature, and pranks were almost engraved in their blood. The last time she sent something to Matthew, he was still in class. In the end, in front of more than ten children. A naughty oak fairy threw him a few pieces of women's underwear. Matthew almost couldn't explain himself. He couldn't possibly tell his students that this was a gift from nature, right? Fortunately, most of the time, the fairies still abided by their duties. Matthew did not argue with them. Chewing on the sweet raspberries, he quickened his pace. At the intersection two blocks away from the security office. He bumped into an anxious Blake. It was a burly, bearded young man. Matthew, I was just about to look for you. Blake was delighted to see Matthew. Matthew's heart skipped a beat. Did something happen? Blake nodded quickly. The farmers in the east found a merchant who was intercepted and killed on the road. His body has just been sent to the town. I need your help. Matthew said without hesitation, let's go. The two of them rushed in the direction of the security office. Blake was the garrison captain of the Public Security Bureau. He was also one of the few people in Rolling Stone Town who knew Matthew's profession. In order to save money for the planting business, Matthew not only applied for a job as a history teacher at Seaver Public School but also part-time as a corpse consultant at the Public Security Bureau. As everyone knew, the Call of the Dead was the most basic necromancy spell. It could capture the souls of the recently deceased for interrogation. With Matthew's support, the Security Bureau's case-solving rate skyrocketed. Time passed. The residents of the territory knew that Blake from the security office was a god when it came to solving cases, so they rarely caused trouble. It could be seen that Matthew had played a big role in the public security of Rolling Stone Town. A moment later. In the morgue of the Public Security Bureau. In front of Matthew stood a ghost with a reserved and blank expression. Who killed you? Blake asked skillfully. The ghost pondered. It's a man with disheveled hair. He's very, very tall. Blake frowned. Why did he want to kill you? The ghost shook his head. I don't know either. 
That day I came back from Jiliu city to buy goods. Because I drank some wine, I went the wrong way. When I woke up, I was already near the ghost castle. I saw a group of people singing and dancing there. There were also many ghosts flying above their heads. It was a terrible scene, those ghosts. As he spoke, his entire body began to tremble. He could not even maintain his spirit body form. Matthew hurriedly interrupted and reminded, Don't be afraid. You're also a ghost now. The ghost said woodenly, Oh. Do you remember anything else? Is there any information that you can provide us? Blake seized the opportunity to ask. The ghost shook his head. I don't know either. That day, I came back from Jiliu City with some goods. It was a terrible scene, those ghosts. Blake and Matthew looked at each other helplessly. Ghosts were like this. Most of them only had a small amount of memories from when they were alive, and most of them were memories with strong emotions. Other than these. No matter what question you asked him, he would only repeat some memory fragments. This was also the limitation of the call of the dead. Blake tried to ask another question. After confirming that there was no way to pry more useful information from the ghost's mouth, he sighed. He signaled Matthew to remove the spell with his eyes. Before Matthew could do anything, the ghost actually looked over. Wait, am I really dead? Blake said sympathetically, I'm very sorry. The ghost sighed and said, What a pity, after I die, my wife will definitely take the family property and take the child to find another merchant to marry. I'm afraid she won't carefully choose a suitable burial place for me. Blake did not know how to answer for a moment. Can you bury my body in the oak forest north of town? There was no need for a coffin. You could just bury me. I quite like oak trees. The last time I passed by, I seemed to have heard little girls chattering and quarreling. According to my grandmother, I believes I bumped into a flower fairy. This is my only wish. As he spoke. His spirit body gradually faded away. Before Blake could speak, Matthew agreed. Sure. Thank you. The ghost disappeared. Blake looked at Matthew hesitantly. Matthew spread his hands and thought, Master Ronan won't mind. Blake touched his head. All right, all right, do as you please. It's your forest anyway. However, this corpse will only be handed over to you tomorrow. There are still some necessary inspections and procedures tonight. Matthew nodded. He took the opportunity to tell Blake about his discovery in the underground cave. Blake's expression was abnormally serious after hearing this. I understand. I'll arrange for someone to ask around. You have to be careful too, Matthew. Don't wander outside the town alone in the future. I've been feeling a little uneasy recently. Oh right, remember to collect this month's allowance. I've applied for double for you. Matthew narrowed his eyes. That's what I like to hear. Tonight's main dish was matsu take pilaf. The side dishes were cabbage egg soup and a few slices of bacon. The taste was amazing. Matthew licked the bottom of the bowl clean. Finally. He could not help but praise, Peggy, your cooking is amazing. Even among the living, you are second to none. As the saying goes in my hometown, the person who marries you is blessed. The Torin skeleton was a little embarrassed by the praise. No. I do this everything. Besides, I'm already dead so I can't get married. After a while, she saw that Matthew was still immersed in the delicious food. Therefore, she gathered her courage and asked, Matthew, look at how well I've done. Are you going to give me a raise? Matthew skillfully wiped his mouth and stood up. Next time. His figure quickly disappeared into the basement passage. Damn necromancers! The minotaur skeleton roared. Matthew pretended not to hear it. He went to the basement and did not start his daily meditation. Instead, he took out a crystal ball that was about to turn grey from the cupboard in the room next to him. Blood ropes in the karst cave. The merchant was intercepted and killed. According to the ghost's description, there was an abnormal group of people wandering around the ghost castle. Just like Blake. Matthew also felt a little uneasy. So tonight. He planned to perform divination. Chapter 5, The Art of the Turtling Mage the divination failed. Matthew stuffed the crystal ball into the cabinet with a calm expression. This was very normal. He was a necromancer and had no talent for divination. Even though he had always taken time to fiddle with it out of his love for divination over the years. But the result was obviously not satisfactory. He calmed down a little. 
Matthew finally arrived at the westernmost room in the basement. There were two large bookcases here, and magic books were placed on them. He was ready to learn some spells that matched his current level. Matthew was now a level 8 necromancer. However, the spells on his system were still the ones he had learned at level 5. It was time for an update. In Rolling Stone Town. It was not easy to buy a magic book that recorded the principles of magic. Not to mention, it was related to the Path of the Dead. Fortunately, Matthew was prepared for the problem. He had always asked his friends in Bion City to help him purchase them in advance. In addition to the portion gifted by Great Mage Ronan. The spell books in this room were enough to support Matthew's needs until he reached level 10. His gaze swept back and forth between the bookshelves. A moment later. Matthew made a list of spells for himself. This was the spell he was going to learn next. Pseudocide, level 7 spell, can fake death to escape. The last dance, level 8 spell, can detonate non-contracted summons. Vampiric touch, level 6 spell, can absorb life force by touching others to heal oneself. Garcia's armor 2, level 6 spell, an advanced version of the level 2 spell, Garcia's armor I, physical defense. Thunder blast sword, level 7 spell, enchants the long sword and gains the special effect of lightning. Strength and summoning, level 8 spell, increases the effect of undead summoning. Learning spells was not an easy task for most people. Most mages spent almost half of their time studying and mastering spells. If these six spells were taught to other necromancers of the same level, it would take at least ten months. And this was under the condition of going all out. But Matthew was different. The speed at which he learned spells was in inverse proportion to his talent in divination. He was confident that it would not be a problem for him to finish studying them within three months. Next, I have to focus on learning spells. I have to apply for leave from school. Matthew came to the meditation room with a stack of books. It was close to midnight. He was a little sleepy. Peggy, a cup of coffee. No one responded. So Matthew could only make a cup of black coffee himself. The bitter and mellow taste immediately made him shudder. I'm energized. Matthew pursed his lips. He casually flipped open a thick book. On the title page. The string of mischievous magic words jumped out. It danced around Matthew's nose. Garcia's armor too, the art of turtling mages. Note. Garcia's self-deprecating skill is as good as his skill. I recommend that every mage learn one of Garcia's spells Ronan. Grand Mage Ronan. I hope that his journey to the astral plane will go smoothly. Matthew smiled. Master Ronan was the greatest benefactor he had met since he transmigrated. Back then, Matthew had just transmigrated and had no idea about this world. Other than the tree planting mission, he had no clues. However, Planting trees also required money, land, and other resources. Matthew had been wandering around Rolling Stone Town for a while, and he was almost down and out to the point where he could not afford to eat. At the crucial moment, Ronan, who happened to pass by, pulled him back. He invited Matthew to his house for dinner and asked him why a spellcaster who studied the path of necromancy did not go to Bion City to develop himself but wandered around a place like Rolling Stone Town with no future. Matthew said that his talent in the path of necromancy was mediocre, but he was unwilling to stop there, so he suddenly had an idea. The path of necromancy studies death and life, but most necromancers seem to only care about death and not life, so I want to try it from a different angle. I plan to plant some trees near Rolling Stone Town. It would be best if I could plant a forest. I want to feel the power of life through this move. It might be helpful for my breakthrough in the path of necromancy. This was a lie Matthew made up to get two more meals. He didn't expect these words to pique Ronan's interest. At that time, he had expressed his admiration for Matthew's unconventional ideas. Ronan told Matthew. He could plant trees on his land. Moreover, the cost of buying seeds and green liquid, Ronan planned to fund half of it. Matthew was flattered. But he still refused Ronan's kindness. He planned to rely on his own strength to buy the seeds. Ronan didn't mind. He wrote a letter of recommendation on the spot, allowing Matthew to go to the Seaver Public School to teach the children of the nobles in the town. Matthew could choose the subjects himself. After that, Ronan also helped Matthew in life, work, and planting trees. Even Matthew's house was provided by Ronan. Later, Matthew found out half of the houses in the Mage District belonged to Ronan. The other half belonged to his wife. Rolling Stone Town was Ronan's hometown, although he spent most of his time in Jewel Bay. 
however, he was the reason why Rolling Stone Town had not suffered any natural or man-made disasters over the years. As for the great wizard Ronan, Matthew was still grateful. However, he was also very clear about the reason why the other party helped him. It was impossible to cling to Ronan forever. He still had to rely on his own strength to grow truly. Thinking of this, Matthew focused his attention. He began to concentrate on studying spells. The next day, Matthew walked out of the security office, followed by two guards. They carried the merchant's body into the oak forest. Matthew skillfully dug a hole and buried him, completing the ghost's wish. Of course. Since he was already there, Matthew did not forget to plant three oak trees. 30 XP was credited. Matthew was satisfied. In the afternoon, Blake came with the report. He told Matthew. The underground cave had already been investigated. He did not find any other clues. The cave was connected to seven or eight deep tunnels, which could lead to almost any place in the gold digger basin. Even the best tracking expert could only scratch his head in this situation. This was in line with Matthew's judgment. It also proved that he was right not to investigate recklessly. As for the surroundings of the ghost castle mentioned by the ghost. As that place had declined for many years and was far away in the mountains, it was highly dangerous. Therefore, Blake was still gathering manpower. He promised Matthew that he would inform him as soon as he found anything new. One night a week later. In the basement. Visbu. A short incantation sounded. Matthew's body was suddenly covered with a layer of thick translucent armor. Your spell, Garcia's armor too, has been successfully cast. Physical defense plus 8. Duration, 180 seconds. He had succeeded. He felt the soft and bouncy feeling of being wrapped up everywhere. Matthew was intoxicated. It felt like he was wrapped in a huge piece of jelly. It's not heavy. However, its defense was very high. According to Turtling Mage, Garcia's armor's greatest feature is that it can be stacked on top of each other. Level I and 2 can provide 3 and 8 points of armor, respectively. As expected of a turtle turtling mage, I like it. Matthew was just about to continue exploring the technique of stacking two spells. Suddenly, an illusion appeared before his eyes. At that moment, he seemed to see a corner of the oak forest. The illusion disappeared in an instant. Immediately, a warm current surged into Matthew's heart. He suddenly had some knowledge in his mind. Your ability nature's gift is in effect. You have gained new abilities, appraisal, and accountant. Appraisal, you can accurately estimate the value and price of most goods circulating in Julia City. Accountant, you have mastered a certain amount of financial knowledge and are qualified for a basic accounting position. Appraisal? Accountant? Matthew was confused. Is this also a gift from nature? He muttered to himself. At this moment, Matthew suddenly remembered. The corner of the oak forest that he had just caught a glimpse of seemed to be the place where he had buried the merchant's body. I buried the body, and nature gave me a part of his ability. This speculation was absurd and even terrifying. But Matthew felt that it was very likely that it was the truth. Do I only need to bury the body, or do I need to fulfill the last wish of the deceased? How many corpses can I bury? Was there a limit to this kind of gift? Would I get a negative ability? Matthew stopped thinking. Everything had to be done in practice. He noticed. In the mission panel, the Teiki symbol had changed. The green energy bar on the right side had risen by a large margin, and it looked like it was about to reach two-thirds of the energy bar. This should also be related to the gift just now. There's no rush. Let's take our time and see. Even if there's a shortcut to obtaining the gift, I have to be careful. I can't turn Great Wizard Ronan's land into a mass grave. Matthew's eyes flickered slightly. At this moment, you finally look the part of the evil necromancer. At the basement entrance, Peggy said charmingly as she leaned against the wall. Matthew ignored her coquettish posture. Is dinner ready so early? Paige shook her head. Big Beard is here. He seems to be in a hurry to see you. At the gate of the fence. What is it? Someone kidnapped Sif. Matthew was shocked. Blake nodded hurriedly. Don't make a fuss. I just received the news. The other party asked for a ransom, but the Lord judged that the other party was only stalling for time and thus delaying the rescue. Currently, the Suki clan is secretly gathering people. I had already led my team to Ghost Castle, but I had no choice but to return after receiving such an urgent report, 
of course, it was only right. Nothing could compare to Miss Sif's safety. Blake concluded, I'm here to remind you to be careful. There might be more abnormalities happening in the future. You don't have to worry about Miss Sif. Everyone will do their best. With that, he left in a hurry. Matthew frowned. Sif was the only daughter of this generation of the Suki family. She was also his student. Just like Bina. The girls at the school liked Matthew very much. Matthew remembered the last time he saw Sif. The girl even told Matthew that she had written an anonymous letter to the city hall, recommending him to be this year's outstanding citizen. Later, the people from the city hall really came to confirm it. Unexpectedly, in the blink of an eye, Sif had been kidnapped. Kidnapping the only daughter of the Suki family in Rolling Stone Town was too outrageous. The other party was really daring. Either it had been planned for a long time, or they were simply mad. Even Ronan's title of great mage couldn't suppress this madness. How crazy was this? Matthew felt deeply uneasy for Sif. Unfortunately, he did not have any clues about the kidnappers. Divination was not his forte. I'm afraid I can't help. He closed the door. Matthew sighed softly. The torn skeleton's voice came from the kitchen. Dinner is ready. Matthew was about to go over. Suddenly. A white light flashed in front of him. An oak tree fairy rushed towards him in a panic. What's wrong? Matthew listened to the fairy's complaints. His expression became more and more serious. Someone set the fire. It's almost near the oak forest. Chapter 6, Arsonist Matthew rushed into the room. He began to change his clothes as quickly as possible. You have equipped mist robe, plus one. Mist robe, armor plus zero casting speed plus 10% slightly increases mental power recovery speed. You have equipped withered wood staff. Withered wood staff, attack plus one undead summoning plus one. You have equipped the magical bag. Magical bag, contained eight slots. Each slot can store up to 12 items of the same type. Currently stored items, rotten spore slash phantom butterfly slash scrolls. After changing into a completely different outfit, Matthew's entire temperament changed. Normally, he was more like a young teacher who was easy to talk to. But now, he was one step closer to the typical necromancer in the public's mind. Dinner is ready. Peggy walked over with a pot of fried mushroom noodles. I'll eat when I come back. Matthew said as he hurried into the night. Ten minutes later. Matthew's figure appeared at the edge of the oak forest. The only thing that accompanied him was a mage fire used for illumination. His expression did not look too good. The appearance of the suspected arsonist had greatly threatened his most important resource. He was like a cat whose tail had been stepped on. In an instant, he became furious. According to normal logic, he should go to the police station for help. However, Matthew considered that Blake must be busy with Sif's matter and might not be able to free up his hands to take care of Matthew's matters. Secondly, he wanted to punish this audacious arsonist personally. This is the forest that I painstakingly cultivated. It's not like any Tom, Dick, or Harry can come and ruin it for me. At the edge of the oak forest, Matthew stood on his tiptoes and looked into the distance. From here, he could indeed see a large fire. The fire had not spread to the oak forest for the time being. Fortunately, there was no flammable fuel in this area. He calmed himself down and realized that the place where the fire was burning seemed to be a farm. There was only a hill between the oak forest and that place. Matthew had met the owner of the farm a few times, and his daughter was very cute. The fire on the farm was so fierce, but there was no shout nearby. It was not difficult to guess what happened to the farm owner's family. They are not ordinary bandits. Matthew calmed down. The oak fairy told him that there were many arsonists, and they exuded an evil and powerful aura. This meant that there was a high probability that it was done by adventurers. He could not act rashly when the enemy's combat strength was unknown. Thus, he observed for a while. Then, he quickly ran to the other end of the oak forest. Very quickly. Matthew arrived at the location in his memory. It was a huge haystack. Below the haystack, there was a place that looked like a cellar. The cellar was not very spacious. The layout was a little like Matthew's university dormitory in his previous life. Puff. Matthew opened the iron lid. He sensed it. Then, he began to use the undead summoning. Under the guidance of magic power. Out of the blue. A ghastly white hand slammed onto the mud floor at the cellar's exit. 
immediately after. One skeleton after another crawled out of the hole. Not long after. At the edge of the haystack, there were twelve skeleton soldiers with pale green soul flames in their heads. Most of these skeleton soldiers had thick bones and high integrity. They also held weapons and small round shields. They were the elites of skeleton soldiers. They were all summoned creatures that Matthew had carefully collected. It took him a lot of effort to make them look like they did now. One had to know that undead summoning was not something that came out of nothing. No matter how powerful a necromancer was, it was impossible for them to conjure a team of skeleton soldiers out of thin air. Summoning undead required materials. Take the skeleton soldiers as an example. Summoning them required a certain number of bones. If the number were insufficient, even if the summoning was successful, the skeleton soldiers you summoned would still be missing arms and legs. Not to mention fighting, they might fall apart after taking two steps. The reason why skeleton soldiers were synonymous with cannon fodder was because the materials they needed were relatively easy to obtain. The others, such as dark warriors, blood demons, bone dragons, and soul eaters, were thousands of times more difficult to summon. Of course. There was also a way to bypass the casting materials and obtain the summoned creature. That was to build a magic circle that pointed to the negative energy plane. One could directly pull the subjects over from the other side. However, the amount of resources consumed was even more shocking. Even a high-level mage would weigh the pros and cons before constructing such a magic circle. Therefore, generally speaking, it was not without reason that necromancers with low morals preferred to wander around the cemetery and mass graves. They were really poor. And someone like Matthew, who had bought almost every bone in the cellar with his own money or picked it up by accident, was definitely a saint among necromancers. Let's go. Matthew ordered. The skeleton soldiers, who were slightly slow to react, slowly followed him. Waves of cold air began to spread. In the oak forest. Even the noisy night wind became silent. It seemed that even they were afraid of the arrival of the undead. Boom. A violent flame exploded in the farmland. The strong wind blew, adding fuel to the fire. He watched as the farm gradually disappeared into the sea of fire. Heiss, who was wearing a black singlet and revealing his muscles, revealed a smile that came from the bottom of his heart. He suppressed the thought of continuing to set the fire. He shifted his gaze to the dark forest not far away. Fine's information seems to be true. Rolling Stone Town is defenseless at a time like this. Hee <laughs> hee, then let me bestow them with a little more shock with the flames. He strode towards the hillside. Behind him. The six followers followed him. Is everything arranged? Heiss asked indifferently. Boss, don't worry. Not a single one survived. They were all burned alive. One of the scarred faces revealed a sinister smile. Heiss nodded in satisfaction. As a level 11 arsonist, he could feel that his strength had increased a little. Not much. But it was clearly visible. In fact. According to the original plan, he should have retreated after burning the farm, but the feeling of having his strength increased made him extremely intoxicated. Especially when he noticed the oak forest in front of him, he immediately changed his mind. He could feel the exuberant vitality contained in this forest. Burning this forest would bring him a great increase in strength. That was about ten times the size of the farm. It was almost the same as burning down a street in a city. However, the risk was far lower than setting fire to the city. No arsonist could resist such a temptation. In particular, Heiss could clearly sense that as long as he burned this forest, the path of flame that was originally very vague for him would become clear. He could no longer hold back his crazy thoughts. Set fire. Set fire. He wanted to burn it. Burn. Burn. Stop. They walked halfway up the hill. Heiss suddenly shouted. The six attendants immediately surrounded him vigilantly. Boss. What's wrong? Do you want to retreat? Scarface asked. Heiss ignored him. He just stared straight ahead with his eyes wide open. The night breeze brought along a faint green fluorescent light. There was a faint smell of decay in the air. It's a bone flame. Heiss looked thoughtfully at the row of figures slowly appearing on the hillside. Skeleton soldiers? A necromancer? Heiss furrowed brows immediately relaxed. Did Fiend send you here? Go back and tell him that I'll find him after burning this forest. As for whether or not to join the church, that will depend on his sincerity. The skeleton soldiers did not move. The person who was hiding in the dark and controlling these undead creatures did not say anything. 
Heiss couldn't help but laugh. You're not going to stop me, are you? With these skeletons. His followers also laughed. Scarface volunteered. Boss, I can send all these skeletons flying with a single kick. Heiss shook his head. His gaze searched the hillside. His gaze was extremely sharp. However, he did not act rashly. After a few minutes, his tense state was instantly relieved. The two huge muscles on his chest also trembled. Don't be so mysterious. I've found your position. Didn't Fiend tell you what I am? Hehe, he, I'm very sensitive to temperature. He looked at the skeleton soldiers and said mockingly, Do you necromancers like to hide among the trash? How uncreative. However, the other party still did not answer. Heiss was finally enraged. If you don't get lost, I'll burn you too. As he spoke, a glass bottle that was emitting flames suddenly appeared in his hand. I'm not trying to be mysterious. Finally, a voice came from behind a skeleton soldier. I'm just waiting for the sacks to take effect UV just inhaled them. Matthew stood on the hill. A large amount of negative energy gushed out from the tip of the withered wood staff. Sack of decay, acceleration of infection. Not good. Heiss turned around. The followers looked a little panicked. They began to realize that something was wrong. Why is my face a little itchy? The same goes for my arm. It's so itchy. Something seemed to be growing. Under their terrified gazes. Some people had red bumps on their skin. At first, these lumps were not eye-catching and did not feel anything. Soon, they became extremely itchy. People simply couldn't control their hands from scratching. He scratched. A large amount of yellow-green pus gushed out from it. Splashes everywhere on his skin. The infection began to grow even faster. As the infected area continued to spread. In the crowd. The aura coming from the negative plane became thicker and thicker. Stop scratching. Kill that necromancer, and you'll be fine. Heiss made a prompt decision and roared. The group endured the itch and charged forward. Matthew continued to wave his staff. This time. He didn't even need to chant. Undead summoning spell, contract item. Your ability instant summon is in effect. Your ability fixed drop is in effect. On the hill. A large green circle of light appeared in the area where the group was about to rush up. Quickly dodge. Before Heiss could finish. A tall figure descended from the sky. Bang. One of the followers couldn't dodge in time. He was smashed into meat paste. The people beside him were also affected by the shock wave and rolled down the hill. Heiss looked over furiously. The two-meter-tall figure was looking around in a daze. Her bones were white and flawless. But the most eye-catching thing was the plate in her hand. Matthew? Do you want to have dinner? Just nice, I just heated up the fried mushroom noodles again. Peggy looked at Matthew happily. No, throw away the fried noodles, Peggy. I want you to fight for me. Matthew said. Peggy's mood suddenly became serious. She turned to face the arsonist. Then, she said to Matthew. In that case, please buff me. Chapter 7, Necromancer's Weakness On the hillside. The two-meter-tall Toran skeleton stood proudly. High stared at Peggy with a malicious expression. She was different from skeleton soldiers. Peggy's bones were much better in terms of color and texture. Especially the bones in her waist and legs. The entire thing had a dark gold color. This color appeared especially mysterious and powerful against the night sky. Matthew did not hesitate. One by one, he took out magic scrolls from his magical bag. Then, he tore it up without hesitation. In just a few seconds. One after another, strengthening spells were cast on the Tauren skeleton. Bear's tenacity. The strength of a wild bull. The elegance of a cat. The owl's wisdom. Sword and sword protection. Negative energy shield. Considering the enemy's occupation. Matthew had even spent a lot of money to give Peggy a valuable heat-resistant ring. This would grant her immunity to fire for a short period of time. Arcane halos descended. These strengthening spells pushed Peggy's combat power, which was originally just a little over tier 3, to the peak of tier 3. She looked like she was not to be trifled with. However, she was still not satisfied. That's it. Where is buff of eagle prestige? Where is the buff of the cunning fox? Why didn't you go all out? Matthew waved his hand. I don't have enough mana. Of course, 
this was a lie. In his heart, he was actually thinking, why would a skeleton like you need extra charm and intelligence checks? Let's do it. Let's end this quickly. As they spoke, Matthew began to mobilize his mental power to command the skeletons to move forward. Peggy did not continue asking. Her right hand suddenly reached for her crotch. The sound of a crack. She pulled out her dark golden thigh bone. This bone blade that was half the height of a human was her most handy weapon. Losing this thigh bone would not affect her balance and movement. But with this bone blade, her ability to deal damage would increase by several times. Phew. The bone blade tore through the air. Peggy charged forward. The followers who were originally blocking the front immediately scattered like birds and beasts. Peggy's target was obviously not these small fries. She took a step forward. The distance of more than 10 meters suddenly disappeared. Bang! The bone blade slashed at the short knife that the arsonist had pulled out in a hurry. After successfully parrying the attack, High's body sank a little. The muscles in his chest trembled violently. His eyes revealed a trace of disbelief. In the next second, the short knife, which was obviously of extraordinary quality, started to twist rapidly. Heiss released his hand alertly. Then, he rolled on the ground. A whistling sound brushed past his scalp. Half of his long black hair had been shaved off. In the middle of his head, there was a gap that looked like the Mediterranean Sea. Damn skeletons! Heiss went on a berserk. He rolled continuously to avoid Peggy's pursuit. Puff! 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 Three bottles of red medicine were smashed on the ground in front of him. A wall of fire instantly formed. Matthew had sharp eyes. He saw that it was blazing glue. Don't barge in. He hurriedly reminded her. The flames of the blazing glue were especially fierce. The heat-resistant ring was immune to heat, but it might not be immune to the destructive power of the flames themselves. Peggy didn't get carried away. She calmly avoided the flames and chased after Heiss. However, Heiss was also very cunning. His movement technique was obviously trained in urban street battles. With the help of an incendiary tool, he started to deal with Peggy. The few sneak attacks of the Tauren skeleton were all resolved by him. Very quickly, there were bonfires burning around Peggy. Her space of movement was constantly being compressed. The situation was gradually reversed by Heiss. The arsonist profession is a bit of a counter for me. Matthew silently noted it down. Most arsonists were evil. He would kill any arsonist he met in the future. It was obvious that the flames were effective against the undead. It wasn't just Peggy who was affected. The skeleton soldiers instinctively avoided the places where the flames burned. Heiss had observed this. He immediately berated the remaining lackeys. What are you waiting for? Use the Molotov cocktail to break through the blockade of the bone shards and kill that necromancer. Heiss' calm command greatly encouraged his followers. They were originally in a state of chaos due to the sacks of decay and only knew how to avoid the pursuit of the skeleton soldiers, but now they also reacted. Cover me. Scarface resisted the itch and called out to his companions. That necromancer doesn't have much mana left. As long as we charge over, we can win. The remaining three nodded reluctantly and began to move in groups. The sound of glass bottles shattering became more intense, and the flames surged on the hillside. Fortunately, this area was barren land so there was no way to form a more ferocious fire. But even so, the movements of the skeleton soldiers were also affected to a certain extent. Scarface used the fire to swerve left and right. Suddenly, he noticed that there was a gap in the skeleton soldiers' movements. There! Scarface shouted. He gripped his dagger tightly and charged forward. The others immediately followed. Whoosh! The night wind blew. The flame that moved sideways had helped him a lot. The gap between the skeleton soldiers became even bigger. Cover me. Scarface charged forward with all his might. The skeleton soldiers on both sides of the road came to defend. However, they were all blocked by Scarface's companion with a fearless attitude. Bang. One of the followers was hit by a skeleton soldier who walked over and hit him with a shield. His head was covered in blood. He staggered and fell. He was still full of hope as he looked at Scarface's blurry figure running away. Scarface would finish the job on their behalf. Chapter 8, Necromancer's Brand I won't let you down. Scarface turned his head to take a look. Then, he began to accelerate. Within a few breaths, he successfully crossed the line of defense built by the skeleton soldiers. 
that damned necromancer. It was already right in front of him. Go to hell. Scarface grinned as he launched his final charge. However, in the next second, his eyes widened. He saw the necromancer suddenly raise his left hand that had been hidden under his robe. A thin layer of cloth slid down Matthew's arm. Under the moonlight, an exquisite crossbow appeared under the mist robe. The tip of the arrow was still glowing green. Scarface's sinister smile instantly froze. Whoosh! The arrow hit his chest. Scarface, who was sprinting, suddenly staggered. After falling, he rolled down the hill weakly. The crossbow is indeed a reliable partner for spellcasters on their path of growth. Matthew skillfully reloaded the crossbow. The performance of these arsonists exceeded his expectations. Fortunately, he had more than one trick up his sleeve. After getting rid of Scarface, the threat of the small fries disappeared. Under Matthew's command, the skeleton soldiers retreated and pushed forward step by step. The remaining three followers barely managed to meet up with Heiss in a panic. But Peggy had already outflanked him from behind. A solid encirclement was formed. Seeing this scene, Matthew still felt that it was not safe enough. There was actually resistance in the eyes of the enemies. It seemed like the pressure was not enough. Why don't we try the signature move of the necromancer? Matthew cleared his throat. He tried to make an evil and hoarse voice that was described in the online novels he had read before. He he, looks like you want to become my servants. He he. The effect of this move was surprisingly good. The followers instantly thought of how their bones would be harvested after they died. The will of the followers instantly collapsed. They began to scatter and flee. However, at this moment, the rotting sacks on their bodies had already spread to their skin, and even their eyelids were covered by a thin layer of blood membrane. Because they could not see the road clearly, they could only run like headless flies, which provided great convenience for the skeleton soldiers to clean up the mess. After a while, three of Heiss' followers were killed one after another. At this point, the only enemy left was Heiss the arsonist. Matthew was not careless. This guy was a real third-rank adventurer and most likely an elite. Under normal circumstances, Peggy might not be able to win against him in a 1v1. He chose a more stable ending strategy. Halfway up the hill. The fire gradually died out. Heiss glared at Matthew with a bloody face. Behind him was a torn skeleton with a bone blade and terrifying combat strength. In front of him was a team of fully equipped skeleton soldiers. This necromancer's army was enough to take down a small town but he used it to deal with a single arsonist and his subordinates. Heiss felt very aggrieved. He really wanted to ask this necromancer what was wrong with him. However, his rationality told him that this was meaningless. The individual quality of the skeleton soldiers is insufficient. Perhaps we can try to catch them off guard. This thought ran through Heiss' mind. But he quickly dismissed it. He looked at the crossbow in the necromancer's hand with fear. A strong sense of unwillingness appeared in his eyes. Whoosh. He scratched his extremely itchy cheek in frustration. In my current state, I can't guarantee that I can kill the enemy with a critical strike. He's lucky. He quickly took two steps to the side. It was right next to the almost extinguished wall of fire. Then, he took out a bottle of purple-green potion and gulped it down. Coo coo coo. Heist drank very quickly. When there was only half left. He stopped moving. The next time we meet. I will burn your bones and scatter your ashes. He threw out a vicious sentence. Heiss turned around and ran down the hill. At that moment, his speed was unbelievably fast. It actually left a long afterimage under the moonlight. Sprint Potion Peggy originally planned to interrupt the other party's action of taking the medicine. However, Heiss was unbelievably fast. He was gone before she could get close to him. At this time, the afterimage quickly swept past the torn skeleton. The soul fire in Peggy's head suddenly lit up. Whoosh! The bone blade moved forward. Thrust! The sound of weapons piercing flesh rang. The huge bone blade cut deeply into High's shoulder blade. Good prediction. Matthew couldn't help but praise loudly. However, High's tenacity was far higher than he had imagined. After taking this attack head on, he only staggered a little. Then, he continued to run without saying a word. Hey, my leg. Peggy's hand slipped, and she failed to retract her bone. Heiss carried it and ran away. Arsonist had an extremely strong ability to escape. Coupled with the help of the advanced sprint potion, 
it would be very difficult to catch him unless an inescapable net was set up in advance. Heiss was very skilled in escaping. Relying on this combination. He had already saved himself several times. He believed that this time would not be an exception. Matthew, Matthew. Peggy was anxious. You chase after him first. Matthew said calmly. His gaze was locked in the direction where Heiss after image had gone. I will not let him escape. Matthew was ready to use his ultimate move. However, at this moment, his body suddenly trembled slightly. Immediately after, a strong desire and hatred surged into his mind. He pondered for two seconds. Matthew decisively chanted another spell. Near the farm. High slowed down. He was in a terrible state. Peggy's bone blade had almost cut him in half from the back. If it weren't for his high tenacity, he would have been a dead man. But even so, he urgently needed a place to recuperate. There's a fire here, so it's not convenient for the enemy to get close. He thought about it. Heiss decisively barged into the farm. The surroundings were all burning with flames, but to him, it was like returning to his home. Arsonists had extremely high fire resistance. If he were a little careful, an ordinary fire would not pose any threat to him. We're safe for now. He was leaning against a stone house that had been burned beyond recognition. Heiss rested for a while. He looked at the bone blade on his back and frowned. Just as he was thinking about how to deal with his injuries and the pursuers. A mournful roar suddenly pierced his eardrums. Heiss quivered. A sharp pain came from his chest. He turned around in shock. He saw a ghost with a blurry face sticking close to him. In the next second, the specter's claw suddenly pulled out from Heiss' chest. Bang! Bang. The heart that was exposed to the air was still beating vigorously. No. Heiss desperate cry was stuck in his throat. Because in an instant, his vocal cords were torn to shreds by spectral soul. You sensed a powerful resentment. Channeling the resentment, you used undead summoning. You have obtained an extremely resentful ghost, LV-8. You killed the arsonist Heiss and his subordinates, preventing the fire from spreading to the forest. You have received the reward wilderness transformation. Chapter 9, The Eye of the Jungle and the Wind of the Oak Tree Wilderness Transformation, you have mastered the basic skills of shapeshifters. You can transform into an animal blessed by the wilderness without casting a spell or chanting. You can choose one of the following animals as your wilderness form. Skunk Raven Duglan Wasn't shapeshifting the unique skill of druids? Matthew was pleasantly surprised. This was most likely caused by the two gaming systems that were fighting against each other. In the end, Matthew chose the raven as his wilderness form. This was to make up for his shortcomings. All three animals were small beasts and did not occupy a high ecological position in the food chain, so their combat ability was very average. Skunks were more agile. In some more complicated mountains or forests, skunk transformation might help escape, but other than that, it had no other advantages. Matthew wouldn't go so far as to turn into a skunk and squeeze some musk for himself to sell. The Duglin was a small dragon that looked like a hound. However, the dragon bloodline in these small animals was even thinner than that of the kobolds. Dragon's might and spells were naturally out of the question. Duglin had a certain storage ability, and there was a natural dimensional space in its abdomen. The size of the space was linked to Duglin's level. Newborn Duglin dragon cubs had one dimensional space and each subsequent level would add one more dimensional space. Each dimensional space was about the size of a medium-sized pumpkin and could store many things. If he had to choose an animal companion, Matthew would choose the Duglin without hesitation. But this was his own transformation. Turning himself into a mobile storage space would instead make Matthew lose his sense of security. Compared to the two animals, Raven's advantages were self-evident. It could fly. And it was very fast. It was worth it just to travel or escape, not to mention that the raven also had excellent reconnaissance abilities. The only weakness of this animal was its low HP. Raven only had one HP. If you were discovered by an enemy who had the ability to deal with the air, you would easily be knocked out. How can this be so perfect? Matthew was quite satisfied with his new ability. In his impression, many powerful mages would turn into ravens. This was a good sign. He looked at the mission pane. The reward for Wilderness Transformation came from follow-up mission 2, maintaining it is also very important. Other than the new ability, he also received 200 XP. The mission itself had not changed. 
This meant that this was a long-term and repetitive task, just like planting trees. As long as a threat appears and the defense succeeds, I can obtain a reward. Then, could I attract a threat myself? To farm the rewards. Matthew was just thinking about it. After all, he had no way of determining the system's judgment criteria. If he messed up, it would be a huge loss. In terms of personality, Matthew actually didn't like to fight and kill. He preferred to plant trees slowly and defend passively. It was enough to obtain stable happiness. Chirp, chirp. The oak tree fairies appeared. They surrounded Matthew and sang praises in a high-profile manner, praising his heroic feat of expelling the arsonists. Fairies hated skeleton soldiers. But they liked Matthew very much. This might be the effect of Matthew's extremely high affinity with nature. You have received the blessing of Fairy Princess Lulu. You have obtained a semi-permanent status, Eye of the Forest. You have obtained a semi-permanent status, Wind of the Oak Tree. Eye of the Jungle, when you are in the jungle, your vision will be greatly improved, and you will be able to see what is behind you. Wind of the Oak Tree, when you approach an oak tree, it will release the power of nature to heal your wounds and soothe your soul. Your mana recovery speed will also be greatly increased. When an oak tree fairy lives on the oak tree, the effect of the wind of the oak tree will be doubled. Fairy Princess? Matthew looked curiously into the fairies. In the end, he only saw a flickering shadow. Lulu was very shy. Matthew had only heard of her name from other fairies, but he had never seen her face. However, that night, Lulu took the initiative to show up and give Matthew a blessing. But Matthew still couldn't see her face clearly. Thank you. Matthew expressed his gratitude to the place where the white light disappeared. Eye of the jungle and wind of the oak tree were both very practical. The semi-permanent meant that as long as fairy princess Lulu was still alive, they would take effect. According to Matthew's deduction, Lulu should have just become a fairy princess. She was still very young. There was also a chance for her to become a more powerful and long-lived fairy queen as long as nothing happened to the oak forest. In a way, these two semi-permanent statuses were no different from permanent statuses. Matthew comforted the frightened fairies. Then, he walked down the hill. At the edge of the farm. The flames gradually died down. The skeleton soldiers dragged the bodies of the arsonist and his followers together. Peggy was wiping her bone blade. Not far away. A blue halo was floating in a daze. It was a ghost with a blank expression. Until Matthew walked over. Only then did the ghost's eyes gradually regain their luster. Matthew, you helped me. The spectral soul realized what had happened. Matthew raised his withered wooden staff, and a stream of negative energy surged into the ghost's body. The ghost's originally almost intangible spirit body regained a little luster. I'm sorry, Mr. Farmar, I couldn't come earlier. Matthew sighed softly. Farmar was the owner of this farm. He and his family should have died at the hands of those villains. Previously, Matthew had planned to chase after the arsonist. He felt an extremely powerful resentment in the direction of the farm. This resentment was actually growing stronger against the raging fire. It sensed Matthew's presence. So it begged him for a chance to take revenge. Matthew naturally wouldn't refuse. If such a powerful resentment were ignored, it would definitely give birth to a malicious ghost that would kill without blinking. He used the dead summoning to respond to the other party's plea. In the end, Farmar's spirit body was transformed into a powerful specter. Spectral soul's strength depended on his resentment. After his revenge was successful, Farmar's spirit body was greatly weakened. If there was no external interference, he was going to disappear soon. Yesterday was Anthony or Farmar's son's birthday. Our family went to town for half a day and bought a lot of things that children liked, desserts, candies, butter bread, and strawberries with frost sugar. When I went out this morning, I felt that the omen was bad. My old dog, Hunter, kept barking, but I found him noisy, so I locked him in the warehouse, I should have known that Hunter wouldn't bark for no reason. He's very intelligent. The group of people rushed in. They kidnapped Lena and Anthony and killed the others. I only had a pitchfork in my hand, and the other men were defenseless. We relied on the warehouse to resist for a while. I couldn't even buy them enough time to escape into the cellar. Damn it. Farmar rambled on. Matthew listened in silence. This was a very responsible middle-aged man. Almost all he talked about were his family, his brothers, and the farm laborers. His face was full of longing for life. However, even with Matthew injecting negative energy into him, 
his life as a ghost was about to come to an end. Unless. Do you want to continue existing in this form? I can help you. Farmar's condition was getting worse and worse. Matthew couldn't help but mention it. Farmar was stunned. He shook his head. No, thank you, Matthew. Thank you for your kindness, but I don't need it. Lena and the children are waiting for me. I should go with them. As he spoke, he looked towards the east. Matthew looked over thoughtfully. His vision suddenly turned grey. Outside the charred stone house. Six or seven souls were clustered together. They gazed lovingly at the farmer. That was his family. Matthew also saw that cute little girl. She looked dazed. It was as if she did not know what had happened. I'm leaving, Matthew. There are some of my savings in the cellar behind the mill. Please take them. Farmar's figure gradually disappeared. I only have one wish. Don't let us die without a proper burial, okay? The grey field of vision suddenly disappeared. Farmar and the other souls instantly disappeared. Matthew's temples were pounding violently. You have mastered a new ability, elementary spirit vision, during your encounter and conversation with a ghost. Elementary spirit vision, you can see a corner of the ghost world. Remark, using this ability will consume a lot of mental energy. Phew. Matthew heaved a sigh of relief. Under normal circumstances, ghosts could only be seen by people when they turned into strong corporeal forms, such as malicious ghosts. Ordinary ghosts couldn't be seen normally. Necromancers could use the spell spirit body perception to capture the traces of souls. However, spirit body perception was a tier 3 spell. Therefore, Necromancers below level 8 rarely had ghosts as their summons. Farmar actually had the chance to become a powerful specter. It was just that his resentment dissipated too quickly. If Matthew was an evil necromancer, he could have forced him to sign a contract with him and not kill Heiss or continue to lie to Farmar that Heiss was not dead. This way, he would be able to obtain a spirit with astonishing combat strength. But Matthew wouldn't do something like that. Next was to clean up the battlefield and check the spoils of war. Matthew first cast his gaze at the body of the arsonist, Heiss. He walked over. He touched it without any courtesy or dignity. You have obtained the spoils of war. 400 GP80SC. Blazing Glue X3, Set. Fiery Dragon Oil X2, Bottle. Molotov Cocktail X1, Bottle. Ring of Invisibility, Unidentified. Silver Frost Brotherhood's Token X1. Secret Letter X1. Muscle Scroll X6, Heightening Scroll X10. Chapter 10, The Dark Knight and the Order of Calamity. Cleaning up the battlefield was hard work. However, if there were rich spoils of war to take. The situation was different. Matthew grabbed a handful of gold coins and threw them into a small mud jar, then placed them into the dimensional space of the magical bag. The pleasant sound of metal rolling could be heard throughout the entire process. There is no sound more pleasant than this. The arsonist was extremely wealthy. In addition to the one he took from the cellar. Matthew had earned more than 500 gold coins overnight. In the past three years. Even when his financial situation was at its best, it was less than one-tenth of what it was now. This money can be used to buy a lot of green liquid. Perhaps I can consider buying a higher level catalyst tool, this meant that many more trees could be planted this spring. Other than gold coins, the wealth of items on Heist blinded Matthew, a poor villager. Blazing glue, Molotov cocktail, fiery dragon oil, these were all good materials for arson. In a low-level encounter, these items could unleash unimaginable power. Without these items, Matthew would have flattened them long ago. Now, the remaining items were in Matthew's hands. Of course, he wouldn't use them recklessly because the undead were naturally afraid of fire. It was just that he had to be more careful when using it. It wouldn't be good if he hurt his underlings. You have used identification on the Ring of Invisibility, unidentified. The appraisal was successful, and your identification skill proficiency plus 10. Ring of Invisibility, level 1 rare item wear this on your index or middle finger, and you can enter an invisible state at any time. Can be used 9 times per day. Attribute, Perception plus 1. Remark 1-1, one, one, when in stealth mode, you cannot move, attack, or cast spells. Otherwise, the invisibility effect will disappear. Remark 2, you still have the ability to collide with the target when you are invisible. If you collide with someone else, the invisibility effect will disappear. 
This is more like a concealment ring. Matthew looked at the silver white ring with a black snake pattern with great interest. This wondrous item was still far from being a true ring of invisibility. However, it could be used more often and did not require any casting actions. Perception plus one attribute upgrade is also worthy of the identity of a first grade strange object. He polished the ring. Then, he put it on his middle finger. The rest of the things were a little lackluster. There was still half a bottle of advanced sprint potion left. He could use it for himself in the future. He did not know which city the Silver Frost Brotherhood was from, nor did he know the importance of this token. It was too troublesome to throw it in the junk pile. As for those illusion scrolls, they were even more comical. Matthew did not expect High's shiny muscles to be the effect of an illusion. This guy was actually less than 1.7 meters tall. The flesh on his body was also loose. There were no signs of training at all. Perhaps he thinks that kind of appearance will help him burn, kill, and pillage. Matthew looked up at the arsonist on the ground. High still had the same horrified expression on his face when he died. The knife marks on his shoulder and the hole in his chest made the corpse look even more terrifying. On the surface of the corpse, the dark red spots were still spreading tirelessly. It was the rotten spore that Matthew had previously scattered into the air. After these spores were inhaled by people, it would rapidly form an extremely itchy sack of decay on the surface of the human body. The sack of decay was a creature from the negative plane. It could replenish negative energy for necromancers in battle. Matthew currently has the ability Rotten Sack Mastery. When the level was high, he could also detonate the Sack of Decay, control the Sack of Decay, and control the infected through the Sack of Decay. This was the terrifying aspect of necromancers. High's toughness and immunity were ridiculously high. His followers had long since succumbed to the infection, but the sacks only appeared on High's body after his death. Crackle. The sacks on High's body popped like fireworks. Low crisp sounds rose and fell. Matthew immediately stopped reading the secret letter. We have to deal with it first, or it will be too ugly. He took out a dark green bottle from his magical bag. Puff. The cork was pulled out. A group of butterflies that were flickering with green light flew out. They flew around Matthew a few times. Then, they impatiently stopped on Heiss and the other corpses. As the green light moved across the surface of the corpse, the dark red marks were mostly gone. This was the phantom butterfly, a creature from the negative energy plane. The phantom butterfly fed on the sack of decay and its spores, making it a good scavenger. Matthew rarely used the sack of decay. Every time he used it, he would definitely use the phantom butterfly to clean up the surrounding environment. This had nothing to do with the system. It was purely his own little obsession with cleanliness. If the rotten spores were allowed to spread, the environment there would soon become similar to the negative energy plane. This was the reason why most necromancers lived in terrible environments. They were not as particular as Matthew. The phantom butterfly only fed on the sack of decay. Once there was insufficient food, it would quickly die. Matthew followed the philosophy of go big or go home. He didn't stop until the fluorescent lights all over the mountain were so green that they were dazzling. Next was the disposal of the bodies of the arsonists. This was Matthew's first time coming into contact with such a complete and fresh corpse. He was still a little nervous when dealing with it. The followers of the five arsonists. Except for the one who was smashed into meat paste by Peggy at the beginning. The other four could be summoned as zombies. Their physiques were not bad. Scarface even had a chance to become an elite zombie. Matthew used corpse oil and secret water of negative plane to simply embalm their bodies. After that, he ordered the skeleton soldiers to drag the others into his secret cave. Zombies were far more powerful than skeletons. Correspondingly, the process of summoning zombies was much more troublesome than summoning skeletons. He needed to think about it carefully. The corpse of Heiss the arsonist was an excellent material. In Bion City. The corpse of such a third-rank adventurer would definitely be sold at a high price by the necromancers. This was because it was the best material to make a high-level undead summon, the Dark Knight. Matthew did not have the ability to make Dark Knights yet. This was after level 12. And he had not even advanced to that level yet. It was still far away. For now. The options in front of Matthew were as follows. First, store the corpse and take it out when he had the ability to make Dark Knights. Second, transport it to Bion City and sell it at a high price. Third, turn Heiss into a zombie and nurture it into a zombie king. Fourth, bury him in the oak forest to see if there were any gifts of nature. 
let's eliminate the second and third first. Matthew's eyes flickered. He did not lack money. Moreover, it was too wasteful to use a tier 3 corpse as a zombie. It was not easy to nurture a zombie king, and there was a 99% chance that it would be a loss. And between Dark Knight and Gift of Nature. Matthew hesitated for a moment. In the end, he still chose the fourth option. He wasn't coveting Heiss' ability. More than that, he wanted to explore the mechanism of nature's gift. If it really doesn't work out, I can dig the body out again. Granted, that will reduce the integrity of the corpse, and the combat power of the Dark Knight will be greatly reduced. Once he made his decision, Matthew no longer hesitated. He found a good place in the oak forest to bury Heiss' body. At the same time, he dealt with the victims at the farm. The skeleton soldiers had average fighting abilities, but they were good at manual labor. He found a piece of barren land to the north of the farm and buried everyone. Only then did Matthew have the free time to read the secret letter. A few minutes later, Matthew's expression changed slightly. To like-minded people. The heavenly change was a foregone conclusion. Yurkus had awakened and was watching everyone on this continent. In time, his great power would make the hearts of the world tremble. The structure of the world is changing. In the near future, the heavenly fire and sea water will pour into the inland, and every piece of land we are familiar with will become an endless purgatory. I have received reliable news that the southern guardian Ronan is trapped in the astral plane, the eastern guardian and the evil dragon in the sea have both suffered heavy losses, the western guardian disappeared many years ago, and the northern guardian has never crossed the heavenly chasm mountains. Witherer, evil art master, inheritor of the path of the undead, avenger, red letter hunter, voodoo descendant, arsonist, conspirer. Don't be afraid anymore. This is the time for us to rise up and walk the dark path. We have established a stronghold in the secret area northeast of Rolling Stone Town, and we welcome every brother and sister who has been summoned to come and join us in this great event. Written by Fien, Southern Shepherd of the Order of Calamity. The above was the content of the secret letter. There were also many provocative words in the letter. The general idea was to encourage all kinds of evil adventurers to come out and cause trouble. It was as if there would be no chance if they did not cause trouble then. Matthew was not interested in these things. What he cared about was. The person in the letter claimed to have established a stronghold north of Rolling Stone Town. He was going to hold a blood sacrifice to please the Void Ruler, Yurkus. And after this blood sacrifice, he would obtain supreme power and could easily flatten Rolling Stone Town. He would also attract the heavenly fire and burn everything. Burn everything. Matthew frowned deeply. This heretic cult believer called Fien was more or less reckless. The truth was clear. Bloody ropes in the Karst cave. Sif. Suki's kidnapping. The arrival of the arsonist. The intercepted merchant. All of this pointed to Fien and the Order of Calamity. Matthew looked at the mission panel. As expected. After he finished reading the secret letter. The mission changed. Follow-up mission 2. Maintaining is also important. Description, a new forest is easily destroyed by an accident. Please protect your forest well. Progress update 1, you have killed the arsonist Heiss and his subordinates, preventing the fire from spreading to the forest in time. You have received the reward wilderness transformation. Progress update 2, you realize that the arrival of Fien and the Church of Calamity will not only pose a great threat to the security of Rolling Stone Town but will also endanger the forest that you have painstakingly planted. You can't stand the threat that's so close to you. Please destroy them as soon as possible. Quest Target, Fien, Level 12 Warlock, and his companions. Mission Reward, Spell Rapid Growth and the Entrance Ticket to the Moonlight Society. Chapter 11, Evil Priest Camp. Rapid Growth. Matthew was delighted. This was also the Druid's signature spell. The green growth liquid he used to plant trees was the potion version of this spell. Its effect was lowered since the spell had been modified into a potion form. If he could master this spell, his ability to plant trees would be comparable to a real druid. Shape-shifting and rapid growth are the signature skills of druids. It seems that the rewards for the quest maintaining is also very important are all druid abilities. No, perhaps it has nothing to do with the mission but with my means of completing it. Whether it's dealing with the arsonists or the order of calamity, I have killed. In that case, is the system working in reward? The reward given for planting trees was the bone dragon of the necromancy element. But the reward for killing and fighting was related to druidism. Matthew pondered with interest. 
There were not many samples at the moment, so it was not enough to make a conclusion. But this did not stop him from making a bold assumption. He glanced at the bottom of the mission panel. The Tai Chi symbol had a new change. The green dots on the left had already exceeded two-thirds. It was not far from being fully charged. He just didn't know what would happen if it was full. On the other side, the grey light spots were still very faint. However, it was much better than before. Matthew had sharp eyes. He could see that the grey speck of light at the bottom was trying its best to surge upward. Whoosh! The dot of light rushed to the one-third position. The heart of nature and the path of the undead. Matthew guessed. The rapid increase of the grey light spots should be related to the battle tonight. The operating mechanism behind it still needed to be explored. But not now. Near the farm. Some people had already discovered the disaster there. More and more people came from the town and the countryside. Matthew led the team back to the oak forest. He sent the skeletons back to the cave. Then, he said to Peggy, I'll have to trouble you to walk back by yourself. Peggy exclaimed, it's so dark, and you want me to walk alone at night? I'll be afraid. Matthew coughed. Then I'll summon the skeletons to keep you company. Peggy said hatefully, you don't give me overtime pay and want me to walk home by myself. Necromancers like you really have zero consciences. Matthew shrugged. I'm not that capable of teleporting you back. You have to understand me, Peggy. Peggy's heart softened a little. All right, all right, I'll go back alone. But next time I work overtime, you have to give me at least one soul crystal. When we signed the contract back then, you said as much. After sending off the talkative Torin skeleton, Matthew looked to the north. The merchant's ghost had mentioned the chaos in the ghost castle. Combining that with the contents of the secret letter. Even if the stronghold of the Order of Calamity was not within the ghost castle, it should be nearby. Time was tight. Matthew planned to eliminate the threat as soon as possible. Thus, he leaped. Whoosh! A raven flew over the branches under the moonlight. It headed northeast. The divination results are out. The enemy's location has been confirmed. They are in a valley near the ghost castle. In the main hall. A middle-aged man with a thin face, fully armed, was calmly patrolling the surroundings. Some of the people present were stung by his burning gaze and unnaturally looked away. There were also some people who raised their heads excitedly to welcome the other party's gaze. They yearned for a chance to gain the recognition of the lord of the Suki family. Blake and Anne. Each of you take a team and surround them from the southwest. You have to be fast and be careful of ambushes. Mr. Zeller, please continue to contact the advanced wizards of Bion City or Stormflow City. If there is anyone who is willing to help, agree to any conditions. Just as I expected, our enemies are not bandits who are blinded by money. They are a bunch of lunatics, scum, and cultists. As I said before, the Suki family will never compromise with such evil scum. Your mission is to kill every villain you see. That's all. In the quiet hall. The Lord's voice was loud and clear. A series of strict and unyielding orders were issued. Those who received the specific mission were all delighted. But gradually, there were also people who looked puzzled. Sir, will our radical actions agitate the other party? After all, Miss Sif is indeed in their hands. An exceptionally handsome young man wearing a magic robe spoke. This also echoed the doubts of the other people present. The Suki clan was indeed famous for its tough attitude toward its enemies. However, the problem now was. Young Miss was in the hands of those villains. If they followed the Lord's method, Sif's survival rate would be so low. Everyone stared at the Lord in confusion. The latter said coldly, it's because they have Sif that we're doing this. He did not explain too much. Instead, he said to the handsome man, Mr. Zeller, in addition to contacting the advanced mages, please pay attention to the clues we found before. Sif couldn't have been kidnapped out of thin air. You should understand what I mean. Zeller nodded solemnly. Everyone, please take action. Use your fastest speed and your strongest strength. The Lord waved his hand. The people in the main hall gradually dispersed. In the end. Only the Lord was left alone. He strolled to a window. Not long after. An owl flew in. To be honest, I don't understand the men of the Suki family very well. You're clearly worried about your daughter, but you still make decisions that might harm her. The owl asked in confusion. The Suki family's lord took a deep breath. In front of everyone, 
I will always be the head of the Suki family and nothing else. Every word I say represents my family. The Suki family would never compromise with evil. This is our motto. The owl was even more confused. Then why did you call me over? The Lord said, I know you can transform into a giant eagle. The owl nodded. Yes. Take me to the ghost castle, and the favor you owe me back then will be written off. The Lord said decisively. The owl thought for a moment. He nodded and said, Sure. But it seems that the patriarch of the Suki family wouldn't take this risk. The Lord tightened his grip on the sword at his waist. At this time, I'm also Sif's father. An hour later. The raven flew over the barren mountains under the moonlight. Occasionally, a ghostly wail could be heard from afar. The ghost castle stood at the highest point of the barren mountain. The fog around it never dissipated. Even if the moon hung high in the sky tonight. Matthew could only vaguely see the outline of the castle. He stared at the mountain fog. He had a bad feeling. It was as if there was a pair of eerie eyes staring at him in the fog. It's said that before the castle was abandoned, it was the former residence of a hero of the human kingdom. It was once prosperous and noisy, but after a strange disaster, a large number of people living in the castle died. The survivors fled in a hurry, and no one could tell what happened. Later on, it wasn't that no one explored it, but the adventurers who dared to barge into the castle didn't manage to come out in the end. It was as if they were swallowed by the fog. The last time someone explored the castle, it was a famous necromancer in Bion City. He got the news from somewhere and publicly declared that the secret to immortality was hidden in the castle. He insisted on entering it. The necromancer was no exception. When he was exploring the castle, he had a fierce battle with a group of demons from the lower world, the old Anubabas, outside the gate. Therefore, the castle was also called the Anubabas Castle. He recalled the conversation he had with Blake. Matthew suddenly felt a chill run down his spine. His perception told him. This castle was not something that he could explore at his current level. Fortunately, his destination tonight wasn't Ghost Castle. He avoided the strange fog. The raven leaned to the west. After a while. In the middle of the mountain range ahead of them, there were sporadic sparks of fire. It was a dangerous valley. There were guards at the entrance of the valley. However, the guards' attitude seemed to be more relaxed. Matthew naturally lowered his altitude. He glanced at the mission panel. Mission progress has been updated, you have discovered the evil priest's camp. Matthew didn't rush in. The mission target was an evil priest. This class usually had an extremely high perception. A sudden appearance of a raven could easily alert the enemy. He flew a circle around the valley entrance and skillfully stopped in the bushes beside the mountain path. There was a battle here. Perhaps even more than one. The mountain path was filled with corpses. There were humans. There were also smaller humanoid creatures. It was a lizard monster. Matthew made a judgment based on his knowledge. The wilderness is so convenient. For a necromancer, an ownerless corpse is a gift from nature. He decisively transformed back into his human form and began to summon skeletons. The incantation and Matthew's magic power injected a mysterious color into the messy pile of corpses under the moonlight. One by one, the skeletons stood up from the blood. Their condition was very ordinary. The soul fire in their brains was sometimes bright and sometimes dark, and the bones on their bodies were in a mess. Some of them were even a mixture of lizard monsters and humans, looking very strange and terrifying. This was the lowest level cannon fodder skeleton. They were nothing compared to the elites Matthew had hidden in the cellar. But it was enough to scare the layman. The magic wave of the undead summoning spell quickly attracted the attention of the camp. A fat man who was more than two meters tall moved over, surrounded by a group of minions. He was wearing heavy armor. Behind him, two teams of people were holding a huge battle axe and a mace for him. Hey! Necromancer? What are you doing? Fatty looked at Matthew with fear. Matthew was still summoning skeletons. Don't you have eyes? I'm giving these souls a new life. Fatty said angrily, they are my people. Even if they die, they are still my corpses. Matthew said arrogantly, not anymore. Bang! Fatty stomped his feet in anger. The already loose mountain path began to shake. Do you want to be my enemy? Matthew looked at him with a faint smile. Your body's grease can be used to refine a lot of corpse oil, but I won't consider making you my slave because your bones must have been worn out in order to support your body when you are alive. Kill him. Fatty was about to make a move. 
A dignified voice suddenly came from the camp, enough. Fatty was so angry that his entire body was trembling. Fiend, let me kill him. How dare he mock my figure? No one dares to do that. However, the minions around him quickly dispersed. A man in a silver robe appeared in front of Matthew. He looked to be about thirty years old. He had blonde hair and blue eyes. He looked decent and had the temperament of a decent person. Tell us why you're here, necromancer. Otherwise, don't blame us for taking action. Fiend looked down at Matthew. Are you Fiend? Matthew was also scrutinizing him. I killed an arsonist and found this. I'm interested in the business you mentioned, so I came here. He threw the secret letter over. Fiend glanced at the letter. He suddenly laughed. You killed my friend and still dare to come looking for me. His originally dignified and upright face also became a little demonic because of this smile. If you would call that trash your friend, then I would be very disappointed, Matthew said rudely. Fiend laughed. He used to be, but not anymore. You killed him, so you replaced him to become a part of our cause. Come in first, my friend. As long as you are interested in the great cause of the Order of Calamity, we'll definitely get along well. Chapter 12, Bone Dragon I already had it. Thanks to the good image of the necromancer and Matthew's superb acting skills, he had successfully entered the evil priest's camp. However, he did not let his guard down. From beginning to end. He didn't even walk past Fien or the fat man. He hid in the middle of the skeleton soldiers. He followed behind them all the way. The fatty named Anjali was getting more and more disgusted by Matthew. Fien didn't say much about it. On the contrary, this was how a lone necromancer should behave. Evil, mean, cunning, cautious. It was obvious that he was not to be trifled with. The valley entrance was very narrow. However, the camp was surprisingly spacious. Matthew found some scattered pottery and utensils inside. These things were obviously not made by humans. This used to be the lair of a group of lizard monsters. He seemed to have seen the doubt in Matthew's eyes. Fien explained with a warm smile, I wanted to invite them to join our cause, but their shamans didn't appreciate it, so I had to kill them all. Matthew lowered his voice. It's fine. They still contributed their strength. Fien looked at the short skeletons among the skeleton soldiers. His eyes revealed a hint of praise. That's true. I've long wanted to find a necromancer to join us, but unfortunately, the necromancers in Bion City have their hands and feet sealed by chains. They're too gentle, like wolf cubs raised in sheep pens all year round. Even if someone takes off the chains for them, they'll only be a whimpering dog. Fine's words were probing. This cunning priest obviously did not let down his guard against Matthew. Matthew replied disdainfully, the chain of desire cannot suppress the necromancer's pursuit of the truth. You only saw the surface of Bion City. Fiend smiled meaningfully. Perhaps. It seems that you know Bion City better than me. Matthew pretended to snort. He did not continue to dwell on this topic but chose to take the initiative. Who is your sect leader? As soon as he finished speaking. The fat man, Anjali, was furious. You're offending the dignity of our lord. Matthew did not give in. Ha, as far as I know, there are a lot of scammers in the outer plains. Their strength is pitifully weak, but they pretend to be omnipotent. Do you understand what I mean? Fiend? You're not the first evil priest I know. Evil priests. As its name suggested, this was a relatively evil class or profession. The power of the evil priests usually came from the sect master they served. Most of these sect masters were not from this plane, but they were abnormally powerful outer layer life forms. They could be fairies from the arcane wilderness, great evil spirits from the lower plains, creations of dusk whose bodies were buried in the astral plane, or divine sins sealed under the bridge of all life. The strength of an evil priest depended on how much power their sect master could project into the plane and how much the sect master cared for the former. Usually, the sect masters would not let their disciples be too weak. However, there were some exceptions. It was just as Matthew had said. The quality of the creatures in the outer plane was mixed and it was inevitable that there would be a few people who were mixed in. Some evil priests were deceived by the outer layer creatures and did not gain much power, but they paid a huge price. Such examples were not rare. You do have some knowledge. Fien was still not angry. He chuckled and said, It's not convenient for me to tell you the name of my lord for the time being, but as long as you join my church, you will have the answer to everything you want to know. 
inconvenient to reveal? Then he could eliminate the void ruler Yurkus mentioned in the secret letter. Sometimes, evil priests did not do things to please their sect master. Instead, they would try to please the people their sect master wanted to please. This means that the sect master behind him won't be too high in status. Matthew thought quickly. He still maintained his sharp and mean attitude on the outside. He looked around. Your church? With all due respect, these people don't look like they can do anything. They don't seem to have any faith in the church. There were about 40 to 50 people inside and outside the camp. This was not a small scale for an evil priest team. However, Matthew noticed that these people did not seem to be fanatical cultists. They looked listless. Fiend blinked. They are just some helpers that I found in a hurry. Some of them are exiled prisoners that I bought from Black Lake Port, and the other is a bandit group that I have incorporated. It's reasonable for you to look down on them, but in the path of completing our career, we will always need some such menial characters. Matthew snorted, and his disdain became more and more obvious. You better show some sincerity and not waste my time here. All right, all right. Fiend shrugged helplessly. I'll bring you to meet someone. I'm preparing to hold a ceremony recently, and she's the most crucial part. Deep in the valley. In a tall tent. Matthew saw Sif. It was a young girl with brown red hair and a pretty face. Her skin was very clean, and only one or two faint freckles on the left side of her nose gave her a delicate and mischievous feeling. She was now wrapped in a thick blanket. She looked unconscious. Who is this girl? Matthew asked knowingly. The only daughter of the Suki family. Fien raised his head proudly. You should know what kind of bloodline flows in her body. As long as the ritual is successful, we can attract the heavenly fire to destroy everything. Matthew didn't say anything. He really didn't know what was so special about the bloodline of the Suki family. He tried to beat around the bush. How did you catch her? Fien didn't get carried away. This is something you will only know after you join the church. How is it? Sir, I've already shown enough sincerity, but you haven't even told me your name. Matthew said casually, you can call me Rog. If I join you, what can I get? Fien nodded. So, Mr. Rog. Our mission is to awaken the calamity through a great ritual. Every time we succeed the Lord will bestow rewards and secret treasures. As long as you join us, you will also receive a share of these blessings. After you break through to the fourth level, my Lord might bestow you with a bone dragon. Bone dragon? I already have one. Matthew thought to himself that this evil priest was even better than him at making up stories. But on the surface, he still looked tempted. Then what do I need to do? Fine's eyes flickered. A small test. Since you were able to kill Heiss, you must have mastered the Death Curtain, right? Death Curtain. Necromancer level 12 spell. The effect was equivalent to a small, weakened version of the undead calamity. Where the Death Curtain covers the place. All living beings would be quickly drained of their life force. Then, one by one, they turned into dead spirits. I do. Matthew frowned. However, the effect of this spell is not good. Even a disabled person has the opportunity to escape the range of the Death Curtain by relying on their will to escape. This was also the awkward part of the Death Curtain. It sounded very powerful on paper. However, compared to the Undead Calamity, which had instant death, the Death Curtain's killing efficiency was so low that the victims could easily escape. Even necromancers who wanted to kill the innocent would not learn this spell. What if they stand still and let you kill them? Said Fien with a smile. Matthew's heart skipped a beat and he immediately nodded. Of course, that would change everything. Very good. Fien opened the tent door and motioned for the two to leave. They arrived outside the camp. He shouted. Anjali. Call everyone over. Then, he looked at Matthew and whispered. Prepare the spell. Matthew refuted, are you crazy? Casting a spell in front of so many people, they will tear me apart. No, believe me, they won't. Fien said firmly. You did something to them. Matthew was puzzled. But why did you do it? Although these people are useless, they must have cost you a lot of money, right? Mr. Rog, you have too many questions. For the first time, Fien showed a hint of dissatisfaction. As they spoke, everyone gathered around. Including the two guards who were guarding Sif's tent. Fien suddenly let out a sharp shriek. Fifteen seconds later. 
these people all covered their heads in pain. Then, they knelt on the ground one after another. At the same time, flagellella-like threads began to emerge from their skin. These grey threads floated in the air. It emitted a strong evil aura. In sight, the priest Fien used curse. Let's begin, Mr. Rog. Fien gave Matthew an unfriendly look. Anjali. Bring that girl and prepare my carriage. He called out again. Matthew looked around. He noticed that other than the big tent where Sif was imprisoned, there were many other small tents in the valley. These small tents were not used for living. There seems to be something hidden inside. In sight, you have sensed a strong curse aura. This is part of a curse creation. Curse creation. Death curtain. Matthew was enlightened. He wanted to create a batch of true evil spirits here. Evil spirit was different from the undead that was purely filled with negative energy. Evil spirits that were layered with the elements of the curse were even more terrifying and evil. Are you guys leaving? Matthew took out his staff and looked at Fien. Yes. Before you came, I received a secret message that the Suki family reacted faster than I expected. Unfortunately, I have to postpone the ceremony and abandon this stronghold. Fien explained coldly, their people are on their way here and I naturally have to prepare some surprises for them. If you don't make a move, then these curse creations will only add a little trouble to the underlings. However, if we could create a real evil spirit in the material world, not only would the spirit be able to make the Suki family suffer a huge loss, you might even be able to please his lord. Mr. Rog, out of politeness and respect, I've already told you everything that I shouldn't have said. Now, please don't disappoint me, as he spoke, his right hand gripped the sword. His left hand was holding a spellbook with an evil wolf head engraved on it. I understand. Matthew smiled lightly and raised his withered wooden staff. A low incantation sounded. Fien retreated to what he thought was a safe distance. He looked at Matthew warily. Until that moment, a strong sense of danger surged into his heart. I forgot to tell you that although I am a necromancer, I am actually a good person. Matthew smiled. In addition, I already have a bone dragon. As soon as he finished speaking, the soundless roar took away all the sounds in the valley. In the distorted air, a gigantic creature covered in bones descended from the sky. Fien and Anjali tried to escape. Unfortunately, they could not do it. A domineering aura spread out like a stone thrown into a calm pond. Your summoned creature has used the ability Draconic Prestige. Evil priest Fien and evil warrior Anjali were stunned, weakened, and scared. Duration, 12 seconds. Chapter 13, Three Legendary Elements A level 15 bone dragon could cause immense damage to most enemies. The main reason was the draconic might that it had mastered. The draconic might of the bone dragon was considered relatively weak among the dragon race. However, one had to consider the power of its summoner too. It was easy to produce unexpected effects. Except for a portion of warriors who had refined their strength and a small number of monsters, most people could only be reduced to lambs waiting to be slaughtered in the face of the draconic might. Evil priests were no exception. Puff. Felice's body smashed into the fat man's body. The latter's body, which had been transformed by evil techniques, was tougher than most humans. However, compared to the bone dragon that descended from the sky, he could only melt like a slightly larger piece of tofu. On the other side, Matthew also took out the crossbow he had hidden in his bag. Whoosh. The arrow accurately hit Fine's chest. The latter showed signs of breaking free from the influence of the draconic might using the pain. Unfortunately, Matthew would not give him a chance. He willed fully his order. Fully tactfully followed suit. Fien had just covered his chest with the crossbow and staggered two steps when he was smashed into meat paste by the four-toed bone claw. Mission Log, you have killed the priest, Fien, and successfully eliminated the potential threat of the oak forest. You have obtained the spell Rapid Growth the entrance ticket to the Moonlight Society. Warning, you have killed evil priest Fien. You have gained the hatred of the evil spirit overlord Omadakai. Omadakai's hatred plus ten. Evil spirit overlord. Matthew frowned slightly. He had thought that Fien's master was, at most, a great evil spirit. He didn't expect that it was actually in existence at the overlord level. However, he did not panic. The stronger the evil spirit, the harder it would be for it to use its power in the material world. As long as he didn't go to the lower planes to court death, this amount of hatred points shouldn't have much of an impact. SSSSSSS. 
Just as Matthew endured nausea and searched the corpse among the mixture of blood and meat paste, a strange voice came from the valley. It was the bandits. There was a hint of pity in Matthew's eyes. The curse has entered their bodies. There's no hope. He knew very little about the curse. But at this moment, these bandits and exiles had already turned into monsters with long green hair and four limbs touching the ground under Fine's curse. Their spines were bent and twisted like mollusks. Their facial features had long cracked. Under the green flagella were countless fine flesh seams and purplish red blood tumors. Hiss hiss hiss. They began to attack each other unconsciously. These curse creations were not true evil spirits. After losing their creator, Fiend, they were only left with their most primitive instincts. They tore each other's bodies apart. Very quickly. The valley was filled with an intense stench. Kill them all. Matthew ordered decisively. Fully did not hesitate. It whizzed over like a bulldozer. Just one round trip. The number of curse creations in the valley had decreased by half. As expected of the strongest summoned creature. My three years of planting trees were not in vain. Matthew nodded in satisfaction. He swept through the valley. After confirming that there was nothing missing. Only then did he walk into the big tent. Sif was still unconscious. Matthew did a quick check to make sure that she wasn't affected by the curse before he heaved a sigh of relief. Sif was a very lovable child. Born in a noble family, she did not put on airs like a young lady. Instead, she was keen on fighting for justice. The residents of Rolling Stone Town liked her very much. Matthew naturally hoped that she would be safe. He did not remove the blanket. Instead, he carried Sif and walked out. In the valley. Fully was having a great time playing. It was like a small mountain, rampaging back and forth. Most of the curse creations had been killed by it. Only a few at the edge were still running around like headless flies. Matthew could tell that Fully was deliberately keeping these crafty creatures to play with. He was just about to remind Fully to stop playing. However, at this moment, an intense warning suddenly shot through his heart. Matthew was shocked. He had no idea no when it started. The mist that had been lingering at the top of the barren mountain slowly pressed down. On the upper level of the valley. The mountain fog continued to descend. It was about to swallow the entire valley. Let's go. Matthew roared. Then, he hugged Sif and jumped onto Fully's head. The bone dragon let out a low cry in unease. It seemed to have sensed the strangeness of the mountain fog. Its huge body started moving. It rushed straight towards the mountain path. Avoid the fog. When they were about to reach the entrance of the valley. Matthew saw the fog coming from the side of the mountain road. What was even more terrifying was. In the fog, he saw a silhouette with disheveled hair. Hurry up and leave. Matthew's heart was beating very fast. However, the other side was a cliff. Can you fly? The mountain fog was about to engulf them. Matthew asked anxiously. Fully did not reply. It spread its featherless and fleshless wings. Then, it leaped toward the cliff. Whoosh! The strong wind mercilessly pierced through the bone wings on both sides. Fully's heavy body sank down violently. Matthew hugged Sif tightly with one hand. His other hand grabbed onto Fully's bones tightly. Woo! Fully let out a hurried wail. Its body fell faster and faster. They were about to land at the foot of the mountain. At this critical moment, the bone dragon's soul fire suddenly emitted a burst of stimulating light. The faint wail faded away in an instant. In the next second, Fully's body seemed to have become many times lighter. Its falling posture was suddenly adjusted to a gliding posture. Due to being forced to jump off a cliff, your summoned creature, Fully, has awakened its potential and mastered the dragon language spell, Advanced Feather Fall. Good job. Matthew patted the skeletal dragon's head hard. Then, he turned around to take a look, still in shock. The mountain fog had already shrouded the valley entrance. However, it finally stopped decreasing. That damned evil priest didn't tell the truth. He must know something about the mountain fog around the ghost castle. No wonder he tried to run away. Matthew broke out in a cold sweat. Fortunately, Fiend did not expect that Matthew only took a second to destroy them. If I was delayed for another one or two minutes. Matthew didn't dare to think further. This world was too terrifying. The first time he took the initiative to go out on an adventure, he almost suffered a big loss. As expected. It was safer to plant trees at home. He slowly came to his senses. 
Matthew looked down at the vast land under the moonlight. The darkness in all directions receded like the tide. The chilly night wind blew against his face. This feeling was not bad. Matthew straightened his back. Let's go home. Fully also let out a low cry. Then, it whistled down the mountain. At the foot of the mountain. The Suki family lord was bidding farewell to the giant eagle. I'm sorry, but I can only send you here. The giant eagle said in a deep voice, My intuition tells me that there is a terrifying evil growing on this mountain. I can't just sit by and do nothing. I also lack the courage to fight against it, so I can only take my leave. You have to be careful and don't get too close to that castle. The Suki family lord nodded. I understand. The location that he divined is in the valley on the west side, which is quite a distance from the ghost castle. The giant eagle folded its wings. So, you deliberately made a big fuss to confuse the insider. The lord laughed silently. Of course. To be able to take Sif away from Zeller's eyes, there must be someone on our side working for the enemy. The giant eagle sighed, the human world is indeed complicated. I hope your courage and wisdom will lead to a good outcome. The lord patted the back of the giant eagle. Then, he pulled out a silver great sword. Those bugs who only dare to hide in the corner and scheme may have forgotten that I, Rigursuki, was also a warrior who had fought alone in purgatory. I swore seventeen years ago that no one could take Sif away from me, I will never let that happen again. As he spoke, he raised his sword and strode up the mountain. However, he had only taken a few steps when a huge shadow came crashing down from the sky. Whoosh! A strange shadow flew over his head. Riagar was so shocked by draconic might that he could not move. Bang! The giant sword landed on the ground. It almost smashed through Riagar's boots. A few seconds later, Riagar, who had barely recovered his mobility, looked over in horror. On the back of the skeleton beast, he saw a figure standing proudly. More importantly, he vaguely saw that the person was carrying someone in his arms. Sif! Riagar shouted at the top of his lungs. It couldn't be wrong. That feeling couldn't be wrong. The nightmare from seventeen years ago resurfaced in front of him. He chased after the bone dragon for some distance in a mixture of shock and anger. But very quickly, the black shadow disappeared into the night. There seemed to be someone down there just now. What was he shouting? Fully flew too fast. Matthew didn't see or hear clearly. At this moment, he was still immersed in the joy of riding a dragon and flying. Under the support of the high-level feather fall, Riagar glided out for more than 80 miles before stopping in front of a hill. Matthew had wanted to dissummon Riagar before sending Sif home. But at this moment, a fire suddenly lit up behind the hill. Before Matthew could take any action, the flames had already rushed in front of him. It was a group of people carrying torches and hurrying along. SSSSSSS. Fully let out a low roar. Draconic might. The sudden encounter had caught them off guard. All of them were stunned to the spot. Matthew also saw the panicked faces of the people. Don't move. He scolded in a low voice. He stopped Fully's aggression. After a long time. Only then did the team recover from their shock. Clang. 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 They drew their swords and retreated. It's a bone dragon. Oh no. Didn't you say that they were just bandits? Amidst the uneasy whispers of the people, a calm and cold voice came from the back of the bone dragon. Captain Blake, we meet again. Please follow me. In the crowd. Blake was stunned. He opened his mouth in disbelief. Please follow me. Under the illumination of the torch. Everyone watched nervously as the figure walked down from the skeletal dragon's back. He faced the crowd with his side profile. Therefore, they could only see a blurry appearance. However, the most important thing was. In his arms was a sleeping woman. It's the young miss. Someone exclaimed. Wait. Blake, who had regained his senses, stopped the others in time. Everyone, retreat. He ordered in an unquestionable tone. Everyone looked at him in confusion. After a few seconds. Only then did they retreat a large distance under Blake's urging. Blake walked forward quickly. Matthew? Is it really you? He said in a trembling voice. Who else? Matthew handed the sleeping girl over. She is also my student. Thank God. Blake took Sif and heaved a long sigh of relief. Then, he looked at Matthew and the bone dragon behind him with a complicated gaze. 
I always thought you were just a lousy necromancer. Uh, do you need me to keep it a secret for you? Matthew smiled. Sure. Then, he reminded them, it's best not to go to the ghost castle. It's too dangerous there. I'm afraid we can only wait for the return of the great wizard Ronan. Blake nodded solemnly. The two of them chatted for a while. Matthew turned around and left. Under everyone's respectful and vigilant gazes. Fully slowly turned its body. The huge skeletal body slowly disappeared into the darkness. Hint, after tonight, the legend of the necromancer riding a bone dragon will spread widely in the form of rumors. Your regional reputation level plus one, Rolling Stone Town. You have satisfied one of the three legendary elements. If you satisfy one more, you can activate the legendary path ahead of time. Three elements, legendary path reputation slash domain slash level. Chapter 14, Defensive Psalms and Loose Gloves. For Matthew, who had always been low-key and pragmatic, it seemed too early to say that he was a legend. However, seeing the same rules as the game in his previous life appearing then still made him feel a little at ease. Legend. It referred to those who were above level 21, had mastered the power of the domain, and were famous. One had to have all three elements. If an adventurer wanted to activate the legendary path, he would have to rely on three aspects, level, domain, and reputation. Under normal circumstances, domain elements were the hardest to master, followed by levels, and reputation was the easiest. Especially for those who were good at fraud and self-promotion, obtaining a reputation was very simple. Therefore, Matthew did not have much hope of entering the legendary path early. Meeting Blake here saves me a lot of trouble. Otherwise, I would have to send Sif to the Lieges Manor myself. Matthew was very relieved to leave Sif with Blake. This bearded man was not only a reliable captain of the garrison, but he was also Sif's cousin by blood. What was even rarer was that. Blake had actually taken the initiative to offer to keep his power a secret for him. I wonder how he will tell the others and report to his uncle, the Suki family lord. The return journey was very brisk. After a while, the crude walls at the edge of Rolling Stone Town could be seen vaguely. Matthew waved at the bone dragon behind him. Let's go back. Feliz was from a negative energy plane. Although they had signed a contract, Matthew still needed a lot of mana to summon him to the prime material plane. With his mere level 8 mana, it was already very difficult for him to hold on until now. If it wasn't for Matthew's intention to test out his limit, he might have sent it back a long time ago. Fully. The bone dragon's soul flame swayed, revealing an obvious reluctance. Go, you did great tonight. Keep up this performance and you might get a reward in the future. Matthew skillfully consoled the creature. Thanks to your encouragement, the loyalty of Philly, Bone Dragon, has increased to 93. The grey reverse summoning array lit up. Philly shook its tail, and its huge body suddenly disappeared, leaving behind only a few pieces of bone powder on the ground. Matthew smiled. This Bone Dragon is much more useful than I thought. However, in the next second. Necromancy contract. The official summoning has ended. Your summoned creature, Philly, has gone all out for tonight's battle. However, during this period, it consumed a large amount of energy, which affected its survival in the negative energy plane. Philly requests the reward for this summoning, five soul crystals. Do you want to pay? Option 1, pay at the original price, Philly's loyalty will increase, and it will be willing to share an ability exclusive to it with you. Option 2, bargaining. Feliz's loyalty remains unchanged, but it may not be so obedient the next time it is summoned. Option 3, refuse to pay, Feliz's loyalty drops. Five soul crystals. Matthew revealed a look of disbelief. Peggy's salary for two months is only one soul crystal. Can the bone dragon be worth 300 days of Peggy's service in one night? His heart began to twitch. Soul crystals. It was a derivative produced by necromancers during meditation. This thing was extremely precious. For high-level undead creatures, soul crystals were necessary for their advancement. Many intelligent undead creatures were willing to sign contracts with necromancers because they wanted a stable way to obtain soul crystals. Peggy was an example. In addition, soul crystals were also essential for crafting magic items, casting forbidden necromancy spells, and setting up undying rituals. It could be said to have a wide range of uses. However, Necromancers were not very efficient at producing soul crystals. Take Matthew as an example. Even if he meditated for six hours every day, 
he could only obtain three to five soul crystals a month. For two and a half years, Matthew had only accumulated more than twenty soul crystals. This was not because he had slacked off in meditation. It was just that the exhaustion was indeed not small. Otherwise, he wouldn't be thinking about how to pay Peggy Lesser every day. I didn't expect to meet a cute scammer. Matthew shook his head in his heart. This bone dragon could no longer be summoned in the future. He couldn't afford it. He hesitated. Matthew still chose to pay the original price. There was no other way. Fully was now his trump card. Loyalty was hard to come by, and he was not willing to lose a lot for a little. Undead contract, you have paid five soul crystals. Fully is extremely grateful. His loyalty towards you has increased to 96. Fully has shared its ability, blind sense. Blind sense, weakened you can perceive your surroundings without using your normal sight, hearing, smell, and other visual organs. Any small fluctuation will be difficult to escape your perception. You can use this ability to detect invisible units and hidden creatures, except spirits. Range, 30 feet. This ability was surprisingly good. It was perfect for detecting invisible units. Matthew's heartache was slightly alleviated. I'll just treat it as buying an ability with the five soul crystals. Later in the night. At home. Matthew, who had taken a short break, perked up again and began to take out the spoils of war from his magical bag. The evil wizard's camp actually had quite a lot of resources. Unfortunately, the storage space of the magical bag was very limited. Bringing back so much was already the result of Matthew's best efforts. Most of the spoils of war came from looting Fien. Compared to Heiss, the arsonist, Fien did not have much money on him, only a hundred gold coins and a few silver coins. Perhaps most of his money had been spent on buying prisoners and supplies. However, in terms of items, Fien was very rich. Defensive Psalm, Spell Book Description, when you hold this book, you can use it as a medium to support your spell casting. You can also use it as a charging support to guide your spell casting. Casting medium, plus 20% casting speed, protection domain spell effect increased. Pre-charge, you can choose three spells from the following list to cast quickly every day. After all three spells are used up, it will take at least 24 hours to recharge. Spell list, mystic lock, spell unlock, rune of guard, protection from good and evil, magic emblem, Mordenkinen's private chamber. Matthew found the defensive psalm on Fine's corpse. Fortunately, it was not destroyed by the skeletal dragon's claws. Gently wiping it, it glowed with a new luster. The book was only the size of a palm and was bound in leather, reinforced with steel and silver. There was a steel lock on the side of the book, and it could only be opened with a key. Unfortunately, Matthew did not find the key. However, he was not discouraged. The steel lock that came with the defensive psalm was not a magic lock, which meant that there was no need to use a spell to open it. If that was the case, he could turn to thieves. I remember that there was a slightly famous locksmith in Bion City. Many people said that he was a retired high-level thief. Matthew thought, unfortunately, I've never heard of anyone in Rolling Stone Town who's good at picking locks. The defensive psalm was a very good magic tool, or rather, the defensive spells recorded in it were precious to Matthew, as long as he could find someone to unlock it. It was the perfect replacement for his staff. Blood Essence Bottle When the bottle is filled with dark red blood essence, you can quickly recover your HP by drinking it. Description 1. Every 10 milliliters of blood essence can restore 5 to 6 HP. 2. You can slowly refine the blood essence fluid by injecting blood into the bottle. 3. The ratio of blood, normal animal or human, to blood essence fluid is 10 colon 1. Current blood source fluid, 125-150, ml. It was shaped like an ink bottle the size of a baby's fist, but it was filled with dark red liquid. Matthew could feel a faint life force from it, and there was also a faint evil aura. Its origins were probably related to the blood race. Putting aside his prejudice, the blood essence bottle was a small top-grade item. A full bottle could recover 18 HP in a second, which meant that it could instantly restore an intermediate warrior from a near-death state to about half HP. This was a treasure that could save a life at a critical moment. Matthew solemnly placed it in the first compartment of his magical bag in case he needed it in the future. As for the blood. Just buy it. It was normal for a necromancer to buy some blood for research, right? Among the remaining items, there was a charged staff that could release arcane missiles five times after charging. 
there was an extremely precious realm heart stone. If it were sold in Bian City, the price would not be lower than 400 gold coins. This was the core material used to construct the interplane array. There was also a one-handed axe with plus one enchantment that could greatly increase the efficiency of logging. Finally, there was a magical glove. Loose gloves, level 2 rare item. Description, when you wear this glove and shake hands with the target, the target's guard will be greatly reduced. Remark, if you wear this glove for a long time, your wariness towards others will also be greatly reduced. Chapter 15, Battle Concept and Gossip The loose gloves was a very interesting strange item. It couldn't directly provide combat power. However, if it was used properly, the value of this glove might even exceed the sum of the other items. The negative side effects were also within an acceptable range. When he didn't need it, he would just throw it in a corner. He sorted out the spoils of war. While Matthew was impressed by Fine's wealth, he also reminded himself, the man didn't even have the chance to use so many of his tools. It can be seen that whenever you fight with others, no matter how well prepared you are, there is a risk of sudden death. Matthew was a risk-averse person, and he was slightly tired of fighting. At least for now, he was willing to avoid most of the battles that could be avoided. If it weren't for the fact that the arsonist and the evil priest were threatening his development resources and he had the bone dragon, he wouldn't have taken the initiative to attack. But he also knew that avoiding battle would not solve all problems. Therefore, he had no choice. How to protect himself in future battles became the most important thing. No matter what kind of battle it is, the core principle must be to stay alive. Only when you are alive can you deal damage. From another point of view, as long as one is alive, even if one is on the verge of death, there is still hope for one to fight with all of one's might and survive. He recalled the two battles tonight. Matthew seriously summarized his experience. The first combat concept he formulated for himself was survival first. As for how to apply this concept in practice, many details were involved. Matthew focused deeply on the concept of beware of sudden death. Any profession with weak health had the risk of dying. This was because this world was filled with all kinds of strange ways to kill people instantly. Master Ronan had once given Matthew a book called The Death of a Mage. The book recorded the sudden deaths of 99 famous mages in history. The last page of the book read. If you still feel that the author is making a mountain out of a molehill, then you are likely to be the 100th mage who will pay the price of his life for his arrogance. Perhaps he was influenced by the book. Ronan held the series of spells of Garcia's armor in high esteem. However, Matthew felt that. The magic armor was useful, but it was too one-sided. Combined with his gaming experience from his previous life, he set the three key attributes to highlight in his mind. Toughness, immunity, will. Toughness was the fundamental attribute that resisted most negative statuses and control methods. The benefits of high toughness were incredible. If Fien was not an evil priest but a sword master, Feliz Draconic might might not be so effective. Even if the Bone Dragon was still a level higher and Matthew's side would definitely win, the battle would definitely not be so smooth. This was the most direct manifestation of the value of toughness. If a thief tries to sneak near me, I can use blind sense to counter invisibility. However, if the other party also has a method similar to the Dragon's might, I'm afraid I can only sit and wait for death. When he thought of this situation, Matthew felt a little worried. Immunity was a key attribute to resist parasitic microorganisms, bacteria, fungi, and voodoo curses. Willpower was more useful against fear counterchecks. According to Matthew's current growth pattern, he did not have to worry too much about his willpower for the time being. The necromancer's meditation would naturally increase his willpower slowly. Immunity was too unpopular, and he was usually the one who used abilities like Rotten Spore to trick others. As long as he was careful, he would not fail miserably. Therefore, he only needed to focus on toughness. Training one's physique could only go so far. Perhaps the druid class has a way to increase their toughness. If it really doesn't work, I can find a shape-shifting target with high toughness. I remember that there are also some low-level passive spells that can slightly increase toughness. After a long time, Matthew finally pulled himself out of his self-reflection. He opened the mission panel. He had already mastered the spell Rapid Growth. With his current mana, he could use it about ten times a day. This would definitely be of great help to the planting of trees. The other reward was a little confusing. Entrance ticket to the Moonlight Society, consumable. Description, with this ticket, 
you can enter the subplane where the Moonlight Society is located with the help of a nature soul in the wilderness or forest on a full moon night. Matthew knew that the Moonlight Society was similar to the Druid School of Magic. But was it really useful for him? Even if a certain nature soul was willing to help him enter the Moonlight Society, would he, a necromancer, really be accepted? Why don't I just give it a try? Perhaps it could work. He didn't have much hope. At the bottom of the mission panel, the Teiji symbol underwent a significant change. The grey energy on the left side increased by a large margin and jumped to about three quarters of its original size. The green energy on the right increased just a little bit more. According to Matthew's previous experience, after he planted four or five trees, the gap would be filled. He was looking forward to the changes after the energy bar was full. The next day, Matthew woke up early and went to the oak forest to work. However, after half a day, he had planted a few trees, and the energy had also increased to the maximum. However, the expected change did not come. This made Matthew think in disappointment, do I need other conditions to trigger it, or do I just need more time? He did not hesitate for too long. After all, planting trees was his job. He was already very satisfied with the ten points of XP he could get from each oak tree. In the afternoon, Matthew went to Seaver Public School and the Public Security Bureau. For the former, he went to the principal's office to ask for leave, while for the latter, he went to Blake to explain the situation at the farm to him. The matter of taking leave went smoothly. Matthew had connections, to begin with. Not only did the principal agree quickly, but he also asked him about his well-being. As for Blake, at least from the reactions of the others, he had done a good job of keeping it a secret. The people from the Public Security Bureau greeted Matthew as usual. It seemed that they did not associate Matthew with the necromancer from last night. The two of them communicated closely in the morgue for a long time. You don't know how chaotic the situation was yesterday. I tried my best to appease my team members and sent someone to inform the other team that they could return to the city. In the end, as soon as I arrived at the town, I was told that the Lord had disappeared. It's very likely that he went to find the kidnappers alone. At that time, all of us were stunned. I hurriedly handed Sif over to the people from the Lieges mansion and prepared to lead the team to the ghost castle again. After walking for a few miles, the feudal lord actually returned by himself. Later on, I found out that Mr. Zeller had a way to contact the lord. After knowing that Sif was fine, he came back. However, I still brought some people to take a look at the barren mountains in the middle of the night. The environment there is very scary. The fog on the castle sinks to the mountainside. I don't know where the bandits set up their camp. Blake rubbed his dark circles and complained softly. Matthew smiled and met Blake's curious gaze. He said casually, their camp is halfway up the mountain in the valley. The kidnappers died on the spot before the fog sank. Blake was instantly dumbfounded. You're too amazing. Matthew shook his head. He chatted with Blake for a while before leaving the security office. On the way home. Matthew's thoughts were still heavy. It seemed that the incident last night had come to an end. However, there were still many doubts and possibilities. First, the order of calamity. From the contents of the letter, it seemed that Fien was just a shepherd, and his influence was limited to Rolling Stone Town and the surrounding cities. Although he had destroyed the entire evil priest camp in one go, it was hard to guarantee that the others from the order of calamity would not return. Secondly, there was a high chance that the Suki family had spies from the Order of Calamity. According to Blake, Sif was kidnapped when she went to the countryside to play. The route she took was very secretive, and no one knew except those close to her. If this spy were not found out, they would always be a hidden danger. Fien also mentioned the uniqueness of Sif's bloodline. This made Matthew curious and uneasy. Third, Fien had mentioned in the letter that the Archmage Ronan was trapped in the astral world. At first, Matthew didn't care. He thought it was nonsense. However, he had just heard from Blake that Ronan had not appeared for more than a year. Not only in Rolling Stone Town, but even Jewel Bay, where he was stationed, had been in a commotion recently. There were several major events that had happened, but Ronan had not appeared. This was inevitably worrying. If this information were true, if that were the case, the days ahead in Rolling Stone Town would not be peaceful. The fourth was about the Ghost Castle. The soul of the merchant who had been intercepted and killed had mentioned that he had died at the hands of a tall man with disheveled hair. Neither Fien nor Angeli fitted the description. Last night, Matthew saw a figure with disheveled hair as the fog descended. 
This meant that the death of the merchant was related to the fog in the ghost castle. However, his corpse was found by the farmer on the road not too close to the ghost castle. This was very intriguing. So last night, was it Fine's curse creation that stimulated the creation of the fog? Or was it caused by someone else? Is it because Great Wizard Ronan is trapped in the astral plane that the evil creatures in the ghost castle are about to make a move? The more Matthew thought about it, the more his head hurt. Until dinner time. His thoughts were restless. Tonight's dinner was tomato cream soup, black pepper steak, and cloves egg tart. Peggy's cooking was still superb. However, Matthew had a poor appetite. What's wrong? My dear Matthew, are you finally in your lovey-dovey state? Tell me, which girl is it that makes you so hungry? It can't be Sif, right? She's your student. Matthew rolled his eyes. I'm just thinking about the problem. Peggy said seriously, don't think about the problem while eating. This is basic respect for food. People will often take things for granted. Only someone like me who has died once knows how wonderful and luxurious it is to be able to eat like a living person. Matthew was stunned for a moment and said apologetically. You're right, Peggy. He threw away those thoughts and began to enjoy his dinner. Peggy supported her bony chin with both hands. That's more like it, Matthew. By the way, let me tell you some gossip. I heard it secretly a while ago. This time, it was Matthew's turn to lecture Peggy. Peggy, how many times have I told you not to run around at night just because you have stealth skills? This is very impolite. If you were caught, it would not only be awkward, but it would also be scary. Peggy shrugged. Then do you want to hear the gossip or not? Matthew scooped up a large spoonful of thick soup. Before the sweet spoon could reach his mouth, his mouth could not help but salivate. Ding! He mumbled. Do you know why the Suki family lord hates necromancers? Peggy said mysteriously, because his wife ran off with a necromancer. Chapter 16, Domain, Oak Tree This was really explosive news. Matthew quickly put down the spoon, his eyes shining. No wonder I've never heard of the lord's wife. Are there any more details? Peggy shrugged. That's all I heard. At that time, the adulterous couple couldn't wait to get into it after they finished talking. I thought they would continue talking after that, so I hid under their bedroom window until dawn. But I still got nothing. Matthew scooped another spoonful of soup for himself. What a pity. Immediately after, he reminded her solemnly, next time, don't stay outside until dawn. It's very dangerous. Your stealth skills aren't good enough to come and go in daylight. Peggy nodded and said, you're right. I was almost seen by someone that day. Matthew quickly asked, what happened after that? Peggy said happily, fortunately, the male owner of the house came back at dawn. The house immediately became noisy, and everyone was distracted. I took the opportunity to run out. Male owner? Matthew was shocked. So you were eavesdropping on a couple having an affair? Peggy crossed her arms. Otherwise, why would I call them an adulterous couple? Matthew coughed. Which family is it? Peggy looked at him suspiciously. What, you want to have an affair with the lady too? Puff. Matthew almost spat the soup on her face. No, I was just curious. He denied it. Peggy crossed her legs. It's 27 White Narcissus Street in the Craftsman's District. The owner of the house is called Bryce. He's a hard-working shoemaker with a good reputation. The female owner is called Jenny. She was once a maid of the Lord's Manor and served the former Lord's wife. Jenny isn't pretty, but she has a smoking bod. Even I have the urge to touch her bones by looking at her. As for the adulterer that night, based on his voice, I could tell that he was a coachman of the Suki family lord. His name should be Dagon. That night? Do you mean this has happened on other nights? Matthew wiped his mouth with a napkin and inadvertently displayed the sensitivity of a druid. Of course, Jenny is famous in the craftsman's area for not rejecting anyone. Her lovers can't be counted on two hands. Peggy's legs were raised higher and higher. But if you want to know, I can also list the names of Jenny's lovers. Thank you, but there's no need. Matthew rejected her. Peggy, it seems that even if you change your profession to intelligence management, you will also be very good at it. Peggy was instantly overjoyed. Matthew, have you finally discovered my excellence? Then when will you give me a raise? I've already used up the soul crystals from last month. 
Matthew stood up skillfully and inadvertently displayed the indifference of a necromancer. Next time. Damn necromancers. In the dining room. The torrent skeleton's roar did not calm down for a long time. The next morning. Matthew deliberately went to the security office again. He sorted out his guesses from last night on a piece of paper and handed it to Blake along with the secret letter. The latter's expression became much more solemn after reading it. When they left the security office, Matthew noticed that a few members of the garrison team were yawning as if they had just returned from a patrol. In the past, the security office had almost no night shifts. It seems that the Lord has strengthened the security around the town. I wonder if the roads, trading stations, and sentry posts at the border have received the same level of attention. Matthew did not think too much about it. He had only done what he could. He would leave the rest to the Suki family lord. At noon. The breeze was warm. Matthew stood on the hillside on the southwest side of the oak forest to choose the site for his next work. Master Ronan's land had been completely covered by the oak forest. If Matthew wanted to expand the planting area, he would have to step into other people's land. He looked into the distance. The map of the surroundings of the oak forest appeared in his mind. To the southwest was Rolling Stone Town, which did not have much room for expansion. In the southeast, there were some farms of various sizes. Most of the crops in Rolling Stone Town grew here. Most of the land here had been bought by the farmers, so there was not much space for oak trees to grow. To the northeast was a barren land without an owner, but there was the scar of the dead obstructing it. Further away were the barren mountains and the ghost castle, which looked ominous no matter how one looked at it. Only the land in the northwest was the most suitable. However, that was the private land of the Suki family lord. If Matthew wanted to plant trees on it, he would at least have to seek the approval of the city hall. The lord wouldn't reject me just because of his prejudice, would he? Matthew was a little troubled. A long time ago, Master Ronan had reminded him that the Suki family lord was a good person, but he hated necromancers. Yesterday, he got the reason from Peggy. He could understand the hatred of the lord. However, he did not want to hang the fact that he had saved Sif's life over the Lord in exchange for the right to plant trees on his land. In short, it was a pain in the ass. If worse comes to worst, I'll challenge the Scar of the Dead. I'll plant a large oak forest along the edge and wrap the Scar of the Dead in it. Matthew encouraged himself. He was tired of choosing the location. He leaned against an oak tree to rest. The afternoon sun shone brightly. It made one feel sleepy. Matthew yawned and was about to take a nap. Suddenly. A violent tremor around him woke him up from his dazed state. What is happening? Matthew looked around blankly. He saw that the oak trees beside him were growing at an unbelievable speed. They had grown from three to four meters to three to four hundred meters before his eyes. The endless shade of the trees covered everything. Matthew stood up from the ground. He looked up at the oak forest. The oak forest was also sizing him up. Matthew could hear their whispers. Ah, how amazing. A necromancer. I hate necromancers, but I don't hate him. Maybe there are some strange necromancers, or maybe this is an anomaly. We should give him a chance to take the test. Matthew walked quietly in the dark forest. A deer that was emitting pure white light ran past him. Two woodpeckers were playing with each other overhead. A frog wearing a gentleman's hat greeted him by the pond he passed by. In the end. He came to a waterfall in the depths of the forest. The waterfall went down 10,000 feet. A large number of green light spots flowed up the waterfall. This light spot. Matthew's heart skipped a beat. In the next moment. An eagle-faced man appeared beside him. The latter said in a low voice, You are not qualified to explore this place yet. After saying this. The scene around Matthew seemed to be rewinding. Whoosh. The green phenomenon disappeared without a trace. Matthew sat under the oak tree in a daze. At the bottom of the mission panel. The green light on the right side of the Teji symbol had been completely consumed. Hint, you have successfully stepped into the subdomain of nature, oak tree, and have completed a short stay in it. As a reward for stepping into the field, you can choose one of the following three abilities. One summon treant, in a forest that is over 500 years old, you can recruit several treant companions. 2 Woodpecker Contract, you will obtain shape-shifting form, woodpecker, and gain 3 times the flying speed. 3 Natural Immunity, your toughness plus 2. Matthew's eyes lit up. What was there to hesitate about? He directly chose 3. 
At that moment, Matthew vaguely saw a green light enter his body. He could feel that his physique had become stronger. One point of toughness can provide a 20% increase in effect. My immunity in related areas is now 44% stronger than before. Matthew was in a good mood. Although it could not be compared to sword masters and monks, who had more than 10 points of toughness, Matthew was rather stronger already. At least he had taken the first step of stopping a sudden death. Detected that you have fulfilled two of the three legendary elements, reputation slash domain. You have unlocked the legendary path ahead of time. Legendary path, germinal. Keywords, undying and natural. Domain status, one-sixth. Revelation one, weak body, low mana, poor mind, ignorant soul. The path of legend has actually been opened in you. This may be the mercy of the heavens or, more likely, an error in the laws. You should not have extravagant hopes. Returning to the mediocre path is your only way to save yourself. Revelation 2, life and death, destruction and rebirth don't always seem to conflict. You've found an unprecedented path. It doesn't matter if it's muddy or thorny. You should keep at it. Please choose a revelation as the motto of your legendary path. Different revelations mean different legendary paths and different follow-up rewards. Matthew immediately took down Revelation 2. Next. As long as he could continue to explore this path, he would carve out his own legend. After he mastered some legendary abilities, his power would also be stronger than an ordinary necromancer. At this point, Matthew finally understood the meaning of the Tai Chi symbol. It was the embodiment of Matthew's legendary path. The general direction had been decided. His path was marked by the two keywords, undying and natural. If the green lights will open the oak domain when full, what about the grey lights? Matthew was looking forward to it. However, at this time, another piece of news flashed before his eyes. You have completed the enlightenment of the oak tree's domain. Current situation of the realm is your first entry to the domain. You have received a permanent status, longevity. Description, your lifespan plus 100 years. You have obtained a temporary status, no pain, no gain. Description, during the duration of the status, you will receive one strengthening experience point for every oak tree you plant. Every 10 experience points can be used to strengthen your summoned skeleton soldier once. Duration limit, 30 days. Chapter 17, Late Night Visitor Is this the power of the heart of nature? Matthew was overjoyed. A short lifespan had always been the greatest pain for humans in their search for the truth. Many wizards would do anything to extend their lifespan. Liches were one of the products of humans' pursuit of immortality. However, if he could extend his lifespan naturally, who would be willing to turn themselves into a cold lich? Matthew had a premonition. As he continued to explore the domain of the oak tree, there was still a lot of room for him to extend his lifespan. Compared to the one-time buff of longevity, the effect of no pain, no gain stimulated the fire of labor in Matthew's heart. If I plant ten trees, I can strengthen them by plus one. If I plant one thousand trees in one go, I can strengthen the skeleton soldiers by plus one hundred. He was completely excited. Although it was a bit of a fantasy to plant one thousand trees in thirty days. However, as long as they were properly planned, two hundred to three hundred trees were still possible. It was currently spring. It was the most suitable season for planting trees. In order to speed up the planting process to the greatest extent, Matthew decided to do both. Tonight, he would write a report to the city hall to apply for planting trees on the land of the Suki family lord. The next morning, he would officially start to plant trees in the direction of the Scar of the Dead. You planted a sapling. You used rapid growth on the sapling. Planting successful. Your affinity with nature has increased slightly. You have received one strengthening experience point, 10 points accumulated. You have gained 10 XP. Your level cannot be increased, the remaining XP has been accumulated, please level up your profession as soon as possible. The next afternoon. Matthew was resting behind a huge rock. The oak tree that had just been planted was about 40 to 50 meters away. But Matthew couldn't sense any vitality from it. The root cause of this phenomenon was the pitch black scar on the other side of the rock. The marker stones near the scar of the dead are said to have been set up by the Suki family lord with his men. They are all in the territory of Rolling Stone Town. They can indeed prevent ordinary people from entering dangerous places by mistake, provided that the scar of the dead does not spread. Matthew wiped his sweat, his eyes very serious. 
He had been in Rolling Stone Town for less than three years, and the Scar of the Dead had spread visibly. Three years ago. The edge of the Scar of the Dead was more than ten meters away from the marker stone. And now, the two were almost touching. It was not hard to imagine what the situation would be like in a few years. This was also the reason why he planted the new oak tree further away. He had to leave enough buffer for the Scar of the Dead to spread in the next few years. How tiring! Today's tree planting goal had been achieved. However, it was not easy to reclaim land near the Scar of the Dead. The terrain here was complex, and the land was barren. There were many factors he had to consider. The only consolation was that the Gold Digger Basin had a rich underground water system. As long as the oak tree took root, it would not die of thirst. The trees planted today are a little too sparse. They can't form a group effect, and their ability to resist disasters will also decrease. He inspected the areas that he might be able to set foot in tomorrow. Matthew pondered as he walked back. As the oak forest continued to expand, he needed more and more time to go back and forth between his home and the forest. Usually, it was fine. However, right now, he was racing against time to earn as much buff as he could. He was going to ask someone to build a small wooden house in the oak forest. At least this month. He was planning to hide in the forest and not come out. In the evening. It was almost time to get off work, and the city hall was deserted. Only Ms. Liz's unique loud voice came from one of the offices. You want to plant trees on his lordship's private land? Yes. Matthew politely handed over the application. He was a particular person. As for the various official rules and regulations, as long as they were not particularly annoying, he was happy to abide by them. This application was written with reference to the model documents handled by the City Hall in previous years. He was confident that no one could find any fault with the content and format. As expected, after reading it, Liz raised her eyebrows. Beautiful writing. Thank you. Matthew smiled. I'll help you submit the application. Theoretically, there shouldn't be any problems because this land has always been entrusted to our city hall by the Lord. There was once a businessman who wanted to contract that place. He wanted to build a small mine there, but his proposal was ultimately rejected by us. At that time, there were already enough mines around Rolling Stone Town. You weren't here at the time. There was thick smoke everywhere. Liz continued, but guess what? The mines were gone overnight. The bosses of the mines lost all their money, and the businessman even came to thank us. I remember he gave Mr. Ormond two boxes of cider but only one for me. Matthew listened quietly. He had heard a lot about the mines in Rolling Stone Town. In many versions of the legend, those mines disappeared overnight. Some people said that the Lord of Rolling Stone Town had offended the Or Elves, but Matthew knew that Or Elves did not exist at all. Some said that this was a curse from Purgatory and that Rolling Stone Town, which had lost its mines, would become poor. But in fact, Rolling Stone Town did not decline because of this. The Suki family lord had established two trading posts at the border of his territory, one in the south and one in the north. They took over the trade routes from the southwest and northeast to the hinterland of the human kingdom and the Eversong Forest. Business at the trading post boomed, and the economy of Rolling Stone Town also thrived. In recent years, the handicraft industry in the town had developed rapidly, and various small workshops had emerged one after another. There was a faint hint of industrialization. Perhaps it was the Suki family lord's credit, but in Matthew's opinion, the five-member committee that had been handling various government affairs all year round had also contributed greatly. Ms. Liz was one of them. About Ms. Liz. Matthew didn't know much. In his impression, this woman was harsh and picky, loved gossip, and had a bad reputation in town. However, she also loved her work and was diligent. This could be seen from the fact that the other officials had already gotten off work, and she was still in the office dealing with documents. The most important thing was. She was Blake's mother, the distant cousin of the Suki family's lord, and Sif's aunt. In a sense, Liz represented the will of the Suki family lord in the five-member committee. This was also the reason why Matthew had specially fined her to post his application. An hour later. It was completely dark outside. All right, young man, thank you for listening to me. There aren't many young people as patient as you. Liz lit the candle and continued to deal with the documents. You can return now. I will help you with your application as soon as possible. After the committee has approved it, I will inform you as soon as possible. Matthew nodded and stood up. He loosened his muscles and bones, 
and his body made crackling sounds. By the way, Matthew, I remember that you are also a necromancer. What do you think of the rumors these days? Liz suddenly called out to him, her eyes full of gossip. Matthew pondered and said, You mean the necromancer with the bone dragon? I heard that he almost fought with the town guards. Liz shook her head. The version you heard is wrong. That necromancer seems to be a friend and not an enemy. Not only did he save, well, uh. In short, he did not seem to be a bad person. She seemed to realize that some things could not be said casually. Matthew smiled gently. Necromancer is just a profession. Of course, he's not necessarily a bad person. Liz looked at him with interest. For example, you? A necromancer who likes to plant trees? To be honest, I really think you've been delayed by your need to be an adventurer. Look at you, Matthew, what a handsome young man. Even compared to my Blake, your appearance is not inferior. As long as you agree, I'll be happy to introduce you to a few daughters from good families. Matthew immediately blushed. I, I think I'm far inferior to Blake. Liz was delighted to hear this. Don't say that, Matthew. I think you're much more pleasing to the eye than my brat. That's it. Come to me tomorrow to get the approval. You can plant whatever you want on the land of the Lord. You don't need to get the Lord's approval. Matthew was surprised. Liz waved her hand. It's just an administrative process. The Lord won't really interfere with political affairs. He's busy taking care of his daughter these days. I still have this amount of power. As long as you don't turn that piece of land into a mass grave, you can do anything. Matthew was overjoyed. So he flattered Liz a few more times. The middle-aged lady was laughing so hard that she bent forward and backward. He waited until late at night. After Matthew came out of City Hall, he sent Liz home. Not only did he receive his approval in advance, he even applied for a forestry allowance. This sum of money was about 200 gold coins. It was taken from the Lord's own treasury. This experience gave Matthew a lot of insight. Thousands of words converged into one sentence, Blake's mother is awesome. It was another night. In the basement. Peggy, a cup of coffee. Matthew shouted twice but did not get a response. He could only get up and do it himself. She can't be eavesdropping under some window at this time again, right? The strong aroma of coffee washed away a little sleepiness. Matthew mumbled. His attention returned to the spellbook in front of him. Introduction to the Thunderblast Sword, How to Stick It Deep. However, he didn't wait long. The copper bell with a thin thread hanging beside his hand buzzed. Someone was ringing the bell outside the fence. A late night visitor for me? Matthew frowned. Chapter 18, You Have to Pay Your Family. Matthew pushed open the door and looked out. Outside the gate. A petite figure stood there. There was no moon tonight. Matthew could only vaguely see that the other party was wearing a dark red cloak and was looking left and right uneasily. Sif. The mage fire lit up. Matthew walked over and saw a fair little face. It was the girl he had rescued from the evil priest's camp a few days ago. Perhaps it was because she had been running, but Sif's face was red, and her eyes were misty. SHH. Matthew, I snuck out. Sif's voice trembled slightly. Uh, is it convenient for you to let me in? Matthew opened the door. Of course, but isn't it inappropriate for you to do this? He was referring to Sif, who had just been kidnapped. Her safety worried many people in the Legia's residence. If she were discovered sneaking out, it would inevitably cause a big problem. Don't worry. I'm not an insensible rebellious girl. Sif took off the hood of her cloak as she walked inside. I sneaked out after the maids fell asleep. There was a mirror image of me in the bedroom to cover for me. Moreover, I won't be away for too long. I already feel very sorry for making everyone worry so much last time. Matthew nodded. He led the girl into the living room and sat down. Do you want coffee or milk? Peggy was not around, so Matthew could only serve her himself. Sif smiled and said, Milk. I can't sleep well if I drink coffee at night. I haven't slept well these days. A moment later. The girl held the steaming milk and blew on it gently. Matthew sat silently in front of her. The atmosphere was a little awkward. Ha, it's so hot. Sif took a sip of milk and stuck out her tongue. I'm here to thank you. Matthew. Matthew observed the other party without batting an eyelid. Sif put down the milk and said with amusement, 
Please, don't tell me you think everyone will believe that story Blake made up. At least I know that my savior isn't some big shot from Bian City, but it's you. Matthew thought for a moment and asked, were you sober at that time? Sif blushed and nodded. I was never unconscious. The evil priest had me smell some kind of power. My consciousness was always clear, but I couldn't control my body. At this point. She let out a long breath, and her face revealed a deep look of fear. To be honest, Matthew, if it weren't for you, I really don't know what would have happened. You saved my life, but I don't know how to thank you. These past few days, they locked me up at home, but I couldn't sleep at all. Every time I closed my eyes, the evil priest's face would appear in front of me. Only when I thought of you would my heart feel a little more at ease. Matthew listened quietly to Sif's confession. Being kidnapped could easily become a person's nightmare. If it were someone with a weak mentality, they would have collapsed long ago. But Sif was obviously different. She only whispered for a while before she put on a youthful smile and said, I really didn't expect you to be so powerful. If the other girls in the school knew about this, I'm afraid that the number of love letters you'll receive during the spring festival will be doubled. But I'm a necromancer, Matthew said calmly. So what if you're a necromancer? Bina is an idiot. Sif said excitedly. She clearly likes you so much, but she was at a loss when she heard that you were once a necromancer. Not every necromancer is a bad guy. Matthew looked at her in surprise. Bina. Sif subconsciously covered her mouth with half a palm and said embarrassedly under Matthew's gaze, Okay, okay, I admit that I encouraged her to confess to you, but what's wrong with that? She likes you a lot. She has a diary at home, and at least 90% of the content is related to you. She even wrote down the color of your socks in class every day. In my opinion, this is what love looks like. Of course, I'd encourage her to show her feelings before she left. I just didn't expect her to care so much about what the world would have thought about you being a necromancer. What a disappointment. Matthew rubbed his temples. He couldn't comment on the views of teenage girls on love. Hence, he could only change the topic. So, the others also know that I was the necromancer. Sif shook her head like a rattle drum. I didn't tell anyone. Everyone else believed Blake's nonsense, including my father. He's a big idiot. However, before she finished speaking. In the corner of the living room, the copper bell strung on the hemp rope rang again. Who would come looking for you in the middle of the night? Sif followed behind Matthew with half a glass of milk. In the next second. Her face turned pale. It's my father. Oh no, Matthew, where can I hide? My lord. What brings you here so late at night? Matthew asked politely from inside the fence. He did not open the door. Firstly, he was not familiar with this lord. Secondly, his daughter was in his house. He was afraid that he would not be able to explain this situation. Is this how you treat your guests? Rigursuki said angrily. Matthew noticed that he was also wearing a dark red cloak. The material was similar to the one Sif was wearing, but the size was obviously much larger. The space behind him was empty, and there were no followers following him. Stop looking, I'm alone. Rigur impatiently urged, let's talk inside. Matthew had no choice but to open the door and lead him into the living room. Coffee or milk? He asked. No need. I won't stay here for too long. Rigger's tone was very stiff. Matthew nodded and naturally sat down opposite him. Listen, Matthew. I hate necromancers the most in my life. But my upbringing doesn't allow me to turn a blind eye to my daughter's savior. Rigger gritted his teeth and said, That's why I'm here to thank you. Thank you for saving my daughter. Matthew spread his hands, but, Blake. Who would believe that nonsense he made up? A necromancer from Bian City who happened to be passing by? Coincidentally, they had met once. Even a third-rate bard could come up with a better story than that. Matthew rubbed his temples and was a little speechless. Seeing Matthew's flustered expression, Rhaegar's mood seemed to improve a little. Don't blame Blake. I watched that child grow up. He has never been a good liar. However, you can rest assured that there are no more than five people in the town who really know the inside story of this matter. Although I don't know why a powerful necromancer like you would hide in my territory, we will keep your secret. Matthew looked straight at Rigor. I'm curious. Even if you can tell that Blake is lying, why are you so sure that it's me? Maybe he really knew some powerful necromancer. 
Ruger sneered and then said seriously, I saw you the other day. Our Suki family has a certain purgatory bloodline, so we also have some secret abilities. In any case, I can be certain that it is you. Matthew nodded. Actually, he didn't want to keep it a secret. He just wanted to keep a low profile. All right, Matthew, let's cut the crap. You can make a request of me. I'll definitely fulfill it within my ability. Ruger stared at Matthew with an unfriendly gaze. I don't want to owe a necromancer a favor. Matthew thought for a moment and decided to mention that he wanted to plant trees on the land in the northwest. Although Liz had already helped him settle this matter. But Matthew was a very particular person. After all, that piece of land was Ruger's private land. In order to avoid unnecessary disputes, it was better to confirm it with this lord when there was a chance. Just planting trees. Ruger frowned. Matthew looked at him with an open gaze. One or two bodies might be buried there. A look of deep disgust flashed across Ruger's eyes. As expected of an annoying necromancer. But you did save Sif's life. I'll give you that piece of land. From now on, we're even. Matthew was a little surprised. Without waiting for him to speak. Ruger stood up immediately. Remember, necromancer. I don't owe you anything in the future. Also, I want to give you a piece of advice. Stay away from my daughter. After saying that, he glared at Matthew fiercely and then went out by himself. Bang. He slammed the door shut. The footsteps faded away. After a long time. Sif's little head popped out of the kitchen. She looked at Matthew with a worried expression. Oh no, Matthew, are you really going to stay away from me? Matthew looked at her in amusement. He said it on purpose for you to hear. Don't make things difficult for him. Sif looked surprised. So Matthew led her to the window. Outside the fence, illuminated by the mage fire, the middle-aged man in the dark red cloak was still standing at the door. He's waiting for you. Perhaps he's been secretly protecting you ever since you came back. His eyes were bloodshot. He probably hadn't slept for the past few days. Matthew said gently, he is a good father. Sif's eyes instantly turned red. She pursed her lips and whispered, I know, I always knew. After mom left, he was sad for a long time. I'm sorry, Matthew. He doesn't mean any harm to you. Matthew smiled, indicating that he didn't mind. Sif was silent for a while, then waved her little fists in front of her chest. I'll think of a way to help him undo the knot in his heart. I know my father is a good person, but I don't want to alienate you because of this. Matthew, do you understand what I mean? The girl looked up at Matthew. Her eyelashes trembled slightly, and her eyes were bright. Matthew did not speak. At this moment, a voice came from the kitchen. You can try to find yourself a stepmother. People say that only new love can soothe the pain from an old love. Sif looked at the skeletal tauren in surprise. Matthew, is this your summoned creature? Sif whispered. Matthew noticed that there was more curiosity than fear in her eyes. So he introduced, this is Peggy. Yes, she's my family. Peggy was delighted at first. Then, her face darkened. Thank you, Matthew, but I have to remind you that you still have to pay your family for her services. A week later. Deep in the oak forest. In a newly built wooden house. Matthew sat by the wooden bed and looked at his latest work. No pain, no gain. Accumulated 83 strengthening experience points. 8 strengthening opportunities. Please choose the skeleton you want to strengthen. Chapter 19, Skeleton Soldier. In the past week, Matthew's life was busy and fulfilling. Planting trees during the day. At night, he would meditate and learn spells. He even found time to find someone to build this small house in the forest. The house was not big, but it was well equipped. In addition to the necessary functional areas, the two carpenters also built a small attic and a beautiful fence for him. Matthew sat on the wooden bed. There was a faint fragrance between his nose and mouth. He vaguely felt that the green energy in his natural legendary path had increased slightly. As for the progress of the undying path, it had halted. This might be related to the fact that he had not summoned many undead creatures or killed any recently. However, Matthew was most excited about the strengthening. There's no hurry. I've already endured for so many days. Let's wait for the sky to turn dark. Matthew looked out the window. The faint yellow sunlight was gradually dimming. Even though few people came to this forest, 
he still maintained the habit of summoning skeletons at night. It wasn't that Matthew was afraid of being disturbed. He simply didn't want to scare the ordinary people in the town. Half an hour later, Matthew walked out of the wooden house. The warm night wind brought the laughter of the oak trees. Matthew opened the cellar lid of the skeleton cellar and woke up the twelve skeleton soldiers one by one. Very quickly. The skeleton soldiers finished assembling. Under the hazy moonlight, Matthew carefully examined the skeletons. He wanted to choose the best one to strengthen. In fact, Matthew had wanted to strengthen Peggy at first. After all, she was at profession level 9, and the two of them had been together for many years, so they had a tacit understanding. However, the problem was that Peggy was a mutant skeleton and did not meet the requirements for this enhancement. Matthew had to pick the best one from this batch of skeleton soldiers with an average level of 3. You. After a 20-minute physical examination, Matthew finally chose the target to strengthen. It was a skeleton soldier that was looking at him in a daze. The reason why Matthew chose him was because he had considered many aspects. The soul fire of this skeleton soldier was more condensed. Although it did not have the most bones, its bones were relatively good. The most important thing was. Matthew realized that this fellow was a little different from the other skeleton soldiers. The other skeleton soldiers would only be in a daze when they were examined by him. But it was different. It had been unconsciously twisting its hips. It was this that aroused Matthew's curiosity. It's said that very few undead creatures can inherit some of their abilities from when they were alive. This skeleton soldier might also have a chance to awaken. With this thought in mind, Matthew ordered it to stand out alone. In order to make it easier to order him around in the future, he even specially gave him a name. Since it's a skeleton soldier, let's call it soldier from now on. Prompt, naming successful. Your summoned creature skeleton soldier number 11 has its own name, soldier. Soldier was puzzled by your naming, but he was still grateful for it. Soldier twisted his crotch at you. It's about time. Matthew ordered the other skeletons to go back to the cellar. Then, he glanced at the summoning panel. Name, soldier. Race, skeleton, LV3. Attributes, strength 14 slash constitution 8 slash agility 14 slash intuition 4 slash intelligence 4 slash charm 4. Characteristics, fear immunity slash disease immunity slash undead race. Ability, step back. High agility and strength. Matthew raised his eyebrows. He tried to invest 10 strengthening points into soldier. Enhancement successful. Soldier's level had increased to level 4, and his overall attributes had received a small increase. Soldier received the enhancement keyword Beginner Enlightenment. Beginner Enlightenment, White Your Summoned Creature has the intelligence of a five-year-old child and can understand some of your simple commands. Strengthening can upgrade the summoned creature, increase its overall attributes, and impose keywords of different grades on them. Matthew was an experienced gamer. He could tell the general direction of the system at a glance. He strengthened Soldier again. Enhancement Successful Soldier received the keyword Short Weapon Specialization. Short Weapon Specialization, Purple Your Summoned Creature is good at using short weapons. When it uses a short weapon, its attack speed, attack power, and critical hit probability are increased by 30%. Dot. Sure. Matthew no longer hesitated and strengthened it with all his might. The next three attempts were all successful. The rewards were two good keywords and a level increase. Weakness Observation Blue your summoned creature can identify the enemy's weaknesses before and during battle. Assassin mode, blue your summoned creature has activated the assassin mode. Agility plus 2, and learn the assassin's abilities stealth and sap. I didn't expect you to become an assassin with some twitches of your hips. Matthew looked at soldier with interest. He wondered if it was the effect of beginner's enlightenment. He noticed that soldier's soul fire had become more solid. There was also a hint of nostalgia and respect in the eyes that looked at him. Hence, Matthew struck while the iron was hot and continued to strengthen it. Enhancement failed. Soldier received the keyword bone loss. Bone loss, gray your summoned creature's HP is reduced by 10%. Would a failed enhancement result in negative keywords? Matthew was deep in thought. This was not unusual. The results of the next two times were normal. One upgrade and a purple keyword. Dirty trick, purple, prerequisite keyword. Weakness observation Your summoned creature is good at using underhanded moves including but not limited to crotch attack, sand toss, and return spear. Dirty trick is actually purple grade. 
Matthew was a little surprised. Soldier looked at him innocently. With its current intelligence, it might not be able to understand the changes in its body, but these keywords would be integrated into its combat instincts. Matthew clicked his tongue in wonder. He walked around Soldier. He noticed that the color of the latter's bones had changed significantly. The gray bones that had occupied most of his body had disappeared, replaced by white and even silver bones. Gray bone, white bone, silver bone, gold, diamond. The classification of skeletons flashed through Matthew's mind. Soldier was now a skeleton assassin. Of course, it couldn't be compared to a golden skeleton with extraordinary talent like Peggy. However, it was not to be underestimated. Enhancement successful. Soldier obtained the legendary keyword Sword Dancer. Sword Dancer, Gold, your summoned creature has awakened part of its strength from when it was alive. Assassin mode has been replaced with the rare profession Blade Dancer mode. Soldier gained new abilities, Blade Dance, Funeral Dance, and Dark Knight Cloak. A golden legendary keyword. Matthew's eyes immediately lit up. After this enhancement, Soldier's temperament had obviously changed. The bones on his body flickered with a silver light, and almost in an instant, all of them turned silver white. A pitch black curtain appeared behind him. Matthew's heart skipped a beat as he ordered, put it on. Soldier was stunned for a moment. The curtain automatically covered his body. In the next second, Soldier disappeared without a trace. Your summoned soldier has used Dark Knight Cloak. Matthew closed his eyes and activated his blind sense. He could sense that there was an invisible unit near him but he could not know its exact location. He was clearly right in front of me. Matthew asked Soldier to turn off the Dark Knight cloak. The invisibility effect of this ability was too shocking. After all, Felice's blind sense was supposed to be the nemesis of invisible units. It seems that I have to be careful in the future. Not all invisible units can be detected by blind sense. But now, the more Matthew looked at Soldier, the more satisfied he was. In time, this guy's strength would definitely not be inferior to Peggy's, and it might even surpass the Bone Dragon. I wonder if there are any higher level gold legendary keywords. Matthew subconsciously wanted to strengthen it again. However, he suddenly realized that he had used up all the strengthening opportunities. He smiled bitterly and patted his cheek. Now, he finally understood why the mobile gacha game was so popular in his previous life. Since the Dark Knight cloak wouldn't consume any of Soldier's energy at night. Matthew arranged for him to patrol outside his house in stealth mode. The cabin had just been built, and Matthew still had a lot of arrangements to make. If it were the old Rolling Stone town, it would be fine. Recently, public security had shown signs of deterioration, so he had to be extra careful. Spell traps were a must. When I go to the market to buy seeds tomorrow, I'll also see if there are any trap-setting scrolls. It's too troublesome to do it myself. Matthew lay on the hard wooden bed and ate a few mouthfuls of bread. He began to miss Peggy's cooking. Why don't I have Soldier guard the next and ask Peggy to come over and accompany me? No, Soldier's intelligence is still too low. He couldn't handle many things as easily as Peggy. Matthew yawned. He forced himself to meditate. For the soul crystals. He could not slack off for a night. Southwest of the oak forest. On the hill. Two figures one tall and one short, walked over. Boss Dean, it should be nearby. The farm below has been burned to ruins. It must be heist doing. The tall man's face was fierce. This guy is really rude. He clearly promised Boss that he would meet you on time. In the end, he ran to such a remote place without saying a word. We can't even find a trace of him. Short Dean stared at the trees ahead. Suddenly. His nose twitched. Heist is dead. The tall man was stunned. How is that possible? Could it be that the great mage had made a move? Dean's face was gloomy. Impossible. It's a fact that Ronan is trapped in the astral plane. He can't possibly lay his hands on a small fry like Heiss. The tall man thought for a moment and said, Is that a local lord? The Suki family was once glorious. Although the current patriarch is a useless guy, I heard that his wife ran away with a necromancer. Dean shook his head slightly. The two of them silently stepped into the oak forest. Heiss' corpse is buried here. Dean looked gloomy. Buried in the woods? Who would do such a wicked thing? The tall man looked around. At this moment. He suddenly pointed into the distance and said. Boss, look. There's a small wooden house over there. 
Chapter 20, Craftsman Protection Association Boss, look. There's a small house over there. As he spoke, he was about to walk over. Don't go over there, Mobley. Dean suddenly shouted at the tall man to stop his rash action. Follow me immediately. Dean said as he quickly retreated out of the forest. Mobley didn't understand, but he still followed Dean obediently. They continued until they completely left the forest. Mobley couldn't help but ask, why should we retreat? If it were up to me, we should set fire to this place. I can feel that this place is full of vitality. If this fire is strong enough, we might be able to advance a lot on the path of legend. Dean was also moved. But very quickly. He shook his head. I've told you and the others in the Brotherhood many times. The most important quality of an arsonist is restraint. It is easy to surrender to the burning desire, but we need to restrain it. Look closely at this forest. It's obviously newly cultivated. And that hut. I just sensed the scent of a domain in the forest. This meant that there was at least a powerful druid nearby, and Heiss was probably killed by him. Before I know his level, I don't want to fight a high-level druid in his domain. Mobley scratched the back of his head and said disapprovingly, but I've never heard of any powerful druids in Rolling Stone Town. Dean looked at him. The intelligence needs to be updated. We'll stay outside tonight and enter the city tomorrow to collect intelligence. After making sufficient preparations, we'll formulate a plan and then take action. Do you understand? Mobley said resentfully, All right, all right. You're the boss. I'll listen to you. The two of them went around the oak forest. They gradually disappeared into the night. At the edge of the forest. Matthew's figure quietly appeared. On his shoulder. An oak tree fairy was chattering about something. These two people are not good people, it was very likely that they were Heiss accomplices, members of the Silver Frost Brotherhood. Matthew glanced at the mission panel. The progress of the maintenance mission was not updated. However, he did not let his guard down. In his opinion, the system was not omnipotent. Perhaps only after he had collected enough information would the mission progress be updated. In comparison, he was more willing to trust his intuition. Did you remember what those two looked like? Matthew asked the fairy on his shoulder. The latter revealed a smug expression, then rubbed Matthew's earlobe hard, revealing an extremely enjoyable expression. The next day. Security Bureau. Pa. Two lifelike portraits were placed on Blake's desk. Blake was still eating breakfast. When he saw Matthew, he wiped the breadcrumbs off his beard and hurriedly asked, Is there something wrong with these two? Matthew nodded. They might be related to the farm fire. Blake stared at the portrait. I understand. I'll mobilize people to follow them secretly. If there's really something wrong with them, I'll take them down. But today is the first day of the Spring Festival Market. There are many people in the town, so I have to prioritize the safety of the people. Matthew expressed his understanding. He was not worried that Blake would not be a match for the two of them. The captain of the garrison team was already a peak tier 3 warrior at a young age. It would not be difficult for him to fight Heiss alone. Moreover, he had many members with excellent weapons and complete equipment. It was common knowledge that if no magic professions were involved, in a situation where warriors were fighting each other, it would always be an irrefutable fact that the party with more people and better equipment would win. Although Rolling Stone Town was a poor and remote place, it never lacked elite warriors. After all, the Suki family lord was a level 4 warrior himself. The only thing lacking here was spell casters. These two paintings are not bad. Can you introduce the artist to me? Blake said as he looked at the two portraits. Matthew couldn't help but tease, oak fairies are probably the most picky creatures in the world when it comes to appearance, and their princess has the strictest eye. They prefer handsome young men. As for you, Blake, you look at least 40 years old, unless you shave your beard, they might not even want to see you. Blake was instantly displeased. Hey, don't talk nonsense, okay? When I went out this morning, my mother even praised me for being very energetic. And what's wrong with my beard? Don't you think it makes me look manly? As for my age, I'm only 24 years old this year. The same age as you, Matthew. Matthew shrugged. Say hello to Ms. Liz for me. He then left the security office. Trade area. Farm Produce Street. Today was the opening day of the Spring Festival Market. The residents of the farms and villages around Rolling Stone Town had gathered here. 
the streets were crowded with people. Matthew squeezed through an ox cart full of white radishes and lettuce leaves. He arrived at a corner of the market. Under the shack. A young man with long hair was glancing at the waists of the people passing by with flickering eyes. Jeff. Stop looking. No one can save you if you steal again. Matthew slapped him on the shoulder. Jeff was shocked. Matthew, is that you? Uh, I don't intend to steal anything. I'm just looking. 